professors of English, North Kazakhstan, and please welcome to our first virtual conference. Thank you for joining us today. The first speaker and opening remarks will be by the association's president and founder, Albina Kasenova. Albina? Oh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Zina, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Zina. Wow. Welcome everyone to a Tank's first co virtual conference 2020, Bridging the Gap in North Kazakhstan. Zina, can you share my presentation, please? Yes. Is it same? Mm -hmm. I can't see it. Is it there? Can see uh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Now I, I, I see you starting the presentation. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Dina. Wow. Welcome, everyone. We are glad to see all of you today. Welcome to everyone to uh, a tank's first virtual conference 2020, Bridging the Gap in North Kazakhstan. Think globally, act locally. Thank you colleagues for being here today. Honestly, what initially was planned for a face-to-face -face <clears throat> conference focusing on the uh, great teachers of North Kazakhstan region prior to the pandemic turned beautifully into this diverse virtual conference uh, with do dozens of participants from every corner of Kazakhstan and some international guests as well. We are just so thrilled to have you so many great educators from all over the world joining us today. Next, please. <clears throat> Atenk exists because of the support we receive locally, regionally, and nationally. Thank you to our dedicated education departments and your partnership and support. Thank you to our, uh, our partner NGO affiliates such as CASD, Kazakhstani Teacher, uh, Teachers of English Association, and our corporate partners such as Marwin, Oxford University Press, and Interpress. I also want to wish a very special appreciation to the embassy, uh, to the US Embassy in Nur Sultan and uh, Regional English Language Office of Central Asia and the National Alumni Network. Our association was established last year in July through a small grant for alumni of the U.S. Department of State's programs. With new financially, uh, financially support from the public affairs section of the U.S. Embassy in Kazakhstan, a tank is posed and positions to continue to make a positive impact on the lives of the many great, great hardworking teachers of North Kazakhstan and other regions, focusing on teacher-to-teacher -teacher engagement, empowerment, and the pro promotion of teachers' educational capacity. Next, please. A tank wouldn't exist without a strong team of experienced volunteer teachers from North Kazakhstan. We're blessed to have such active tank members always wanting to contribute to their learning communities. They come from all over North Kazakhstan, rural and urban industries alike. I can't express more than enough my gratitude to all tank members collectively and embrace collaboration, responsibility and mutual investment in sincerely making a difference one step at a time. We are living proof of this. There are different reasons why teachers would like to join. For, some, uh, for someone, it could be a certificate-driven reason. Others are seeking professional development and networking. Some seek mentorship, guidance, and support from experienced volunteer professionals, while others may simply desire uh, opportunities to build confidence or their leadership capacity. But I think the most important reason to join a local or regional association is that the same as knowing your learners' needs, local and regional, regional association can offer more personalized and localized support and facilitation for teacher-to-teacher -teacher engagement, therefore provide more optimized opportunities for leadership 
for educational leadership capacity building. I, I really enjoyed this quote from American English website for teachers, uh, for teacher trainers and association section. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In one and a half years, we organized different events for teachers and even for the students of North Kazakhstan. On this slide, you can see some eye-popping numbers for a smaller underrepresented region of, in, North, uh, in Kazakhstan. Over 450 participants combined in our English Song Contest, Best Lesson Plan Contest, uh, their Tank Olympiad. On the slide, you can see a, a picture here uh, from the performance room at our amazing English Song Competition. Even a winter storm didn't stop the many dedicated educators from driving four, four, five hours in the middle of night to support their learners and their performance. Just look at how crowded the room, uh, the room is. All 14 districts represented, you will see an image on the next slide to clearly show how much deep of reach a tank has made in rural communities. 20 or more of our members this past year participated in the U.S. Department of State exchange programs. We are proud of our, uh, of our accomplishments. This slide doesn't mention, though, the countries, uh, the countless number of different professional development in meetings with teachers, or, uh, teachers at the American Corn and Petropolisk. Our members eagerly participated and arrived even from the furthest corners of the region, even uh, on a Saturday morning. Winners of our contest had a great opportunity to get free um, PKT tests, teaching knowledge uh, tests, uh, their online CELTA preparation courses, and even facilitation on writing the application to different programs such as e-teacher program, T program, and etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Here's uh, the image I promised to visually show uh, you the impact and reach of a tank in its region. This is, uh, this is a pie chart showing the breakdown of our 153 participants by district in our Tank Olympia 2020. Keep in mind, this was during the initial chaotic time of the pandemic in April, and still teachers were hungry for opportunity. Not discouraged by a difficult time, hungry to become better and to be challenged. As you can clearly see, rural districts contributed almost three, three times the amount of participants to urban Petropavlovsk area. Having this type of analytical data helps us to understand what areas of North Kazakhstan we have to focus on and more, um, more and provide uh, informational support in order to create an even bigger impact. Thank you. Yes, for instance, today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to announce our winners of the Best Teacher Award competition. Which, start, which started in early September and has just finished in October. More than 70 teachers across North Kazakhstan actively uh, took part in our contest. The contest consists of three stages. First stage, teachers took a 30 question test based on teaching English methodology. Second stage was an essay writing and third stage was a video presentation. We also have, have four categories of contestants, as you can see on the slide. Also, you can see there are marvelous prizes and gifts provided by the National Alumni Network, U.S. Embassy to Kazakhstan, and Oxford University Press. We received so many great submissions for our, from our teachers. It wasn't an easy task for Durham panel to make a decision. Stay tuned. We will announce the winner's life at the end of our conference. Okay. I want to introduce everyone, one of the uh, association's main ambitious projects this year and going forward, the Tank Ambassadors Program. Through a generous new grant with the public affairs sections of the U.S. Embassy in Kazakhstan, this project will focus on developing the educational leadership um, 
capacity of the uh, of English uh, teachers uh, from North Kazakhstan and Petropavlovsk as official uh, ambassadors of a tank. This main goal of the project is to establish an enthusiastic team of teacher leaders uh, across North Kazakhstan in all 14 districts to promote best teaching practices with a localized approach in delivering it. The 14 selected English teachers will be uh, a tanks ambassadors in their districts, presenting our mission and facilitating professional development opportunities in all levels, especially rural areas. A tank will organize different professional development workshops and training sessions in all 14 districts where a tank ambassadors will be asked to conduct uh, to, con uh, to conduct and lead the events. These ambassadors will also have dri uh, help drive and lead participation in larger regional events held by a tank, as uh, I have shown you earlier, with our many competitions and contests and projects. Invest, engage, and inspire uh, will be the words echoed by all. Next. Here are our ambassadors. Actually, we just finished yesterday our five-day training for our new Tank Ambassadors team from all 14 districts from North Kazakhstan. Now we have 16 enthusiastic educational leaders across North Kazakhstan. These will be our agents of change. If you would like to join our association or just would like to present or participate in our projects, please contact your ambassadors in your area. All the information is out on our website. Yes, thanks. I can't express more than enough my gratitude to our Instagram followers of a tank for the donation uh, they contributed to, con uh, to create our own website. In less than a month last year, our teachers of North Kazakhstan made our website, uh, website happen. So you can see, you can, uh, you can visit our website, our Instagram and Facebook page. Also, I would like to mention uh, that the e-certificates will be, um, e-certificates of this conference will be sent via email to all the attendees of this conference. At the end, uh, at the end of this um, conference, the link will be provided in the chat box. Please complete the Google form and provide your names and you would, um, how you would like your name to be written on the certificate and provide your email address. Now, I would like uh, to give the floor to our Active a Tank member Valentina Chernych. Mrs. Valentina is the head of our uh, is the head of education department for the content and quality assurance of education in Petropavlovsk. We are lucky to have Valentina as our Tank Active member because she is originally an English teacher. Valentina graduated from North Kazakhstan State University and started her career career path as an English teacher in Russia. In 2019, she was a winner of the Best Teacher Awards in Petropavlovsk and also participated in different projects by British Council in Kazakhstan. Holding these credentials, she became a teacher, uh, a teaching method specialist at the Education Department for North Kazakhstan region. Since 2013, Valentina has been promoted as a head of the content and quality assurance um, department. Uh, she's an active um, a tank member, as I mentioned, and she was a jury member of our English contest, uh, uh, contest English song contest competition 2020. Valentina, the floor is for you. Thanks, uh, we can't see your presentation. I have no uh, presentation, but I have some uh, words uh, for all teachers. Uh, can I continue? May I continue as well? Okay. <clears throat> uh, good morning, dear colleagues. First of all, thanks for a great opportunity to meet uh, some of the best teachers of North Kazakhstan. I'm very pleased to greet you on this conference. Main educational goals are not only to teach students, but to develop their skills, learn to make own decisions. Only teachers who are not burdened 
or with other functions can do this. Let me, on behalf of the educational department, tell you about the measures of the government support for teachers. Dear participants, I was asked to talk about this topic in Russian. That's why I continue my short speech in Russian. Uh, are you agree? Как я уже говорила, государство буквально в течение двух-трех последних лет проводится последовательная политика поддержки педагогов, освобождение от их от, невыпол, от выполнения несвойственных учителям функций, обеспечение материальных и нематериальных стимулов педагогического труда, особенно школьных учителей. Эпохальным событием является принятие закона о статусе педагога. Принятие и утверждение государственной программы развития образования и науки на 2021-2025 годы, в которой отражены цели повышения престижа учительской профессии, изменения системы аттестации педагогических кадров, повышение заработной платы в течение четырех лет буквально 100%. Уважаемые участники конференции, государственной программы развития образования определены Главные задачи по повышению востребованности педагогических специальностей. Первым шагом явилось определение четких обязанностей, которые должен выполнять учитель. Вспомните, пожалуйста, еще не так давно, как каждый из нас дважды в год обязан был обходить микроучасток для выявления охвата детей обучением. Вспомните, пожалуйста, в каких только ситуациях мы с вами не бывали, в какие только... Дома мы не попадали, с какими людьми мы только не встречались. Сейчас эта обязанность выполняется за счет интеграции электронных баз заинтересованных ведомств. Сами не обязаны во внеурочное время ходить по квартирам, извиняться и объяснять, почему мы торгаемся в ту или иную среду. Далее, когда у нас с вами был повод встретиться со всей педагогической общественностью в одном и том, том же месте и в одно и то же время, помните? ситуации правильно при проведении культурно-массовых мероприятий, когда, невзирая на выходной, праздничный день или даже наличие уроков, мы с вами выходили на площадь и э, все культурно-массовые мероприятия проводились при нашем с вами непосредственном участии. участии. Законом о статусе педагога это запрещено. Закон гласит, при осуществлении педагогам профессиональной деятельности не допускается привлечение к видам работ, не связанных с профессиональными обязанностями. Запрещено истребование лишней отчетности или информации, и в связи с этим был утвержден перечень документов и отчетности для каждой категории педагогических работников, в том числе и для учителей. Вспомните, пожалуйста, идет урок, Входит завуч и говорит, срочно, через 10-15 минут, вот такую вот такую информацию мне на стол, и быстренько вот такой отчет, сколько двоек, сколько пятерок, сколько неуспевающих и так далее. Сейчас с этим справляется прекрасно национальная образовательная база данных и фундалит. Запрещены необоснованные проверки, поэтому сейчас строго регламентированы формы и методы внутришкольного контроля их периодичность и число посещаемых администрацией уроков. Раньше, если мы только пришли в школу, я вот буквально могу сказать по себе, завуч буквально селился в твоем кабинете, и каждый урок у тебя был как открытый, и ты как на передовой линии каждый день готовился к этому уроку, как то ли к первому в своей жизни, то ли к последнему в своей жизни. Это уже как у кого нервная система позволяла. Впервые законом оговорены права учителей, одним из которых является право на материальное обеспечение. Здесь хотелось бы особо отметить, что со следующего учебного года в государственных организациях образования устанавливается нормативная учебная нагрузка в неделю 16 часов для организаций среднего образования и 18 часов для специализированных и специальных организаций образования. Во-вторых, устанавливается доплата, уже установлена, за степень магистра по научно-методическому направлению в размере десятикратного месячного расчетного показателя. То есть, если ваша магистрская диссертация соответствует педагогическому направлению, учебно-методическому, вы имеете право на доплату. 
Далее, ежегодно за счет средств республиканского бюджета обладателю звания «Лучший педагог» выплачивается премия. В текущем году она составила более 2,2 миллионов тенге. В области в этом году удостоены звания «Лучший педагог» и смогли получить данные премии четыре победителя. К сожалению, в этом списке не было учителей английского языка. Но, пользуясь возможностью, я призываю вас, уважаемые коллеги, принять участие в конкурсе в следующем году. Кроме того, мы с вами все ежегодно готовим наших учеников к олимпиадам, интеллектуальным турнирам и конкурсам. Так вот, этим же законом о статусе педагога регламентировано, что за счет экономии учителям, подготовивших победителей международных интеллектуальных турниров, олимпиад, спортивных соревнований, также предусматриваются доплаты, поощрения. Как я уже говорила, в законе предусмотрены и нематериальные поощрения, и социальные льготы. И главным, по моему мнению, является то, что для, учич... для детей учителей место в детских садах и мини-центрах предоставляется во внеочередном порядке. Кроме того, для сельских учителей местными исполнительными органами предусматривается социальная поддержка по оплате коммунальных услуг, приобретения топлива в размерах, установленных районными акиматами, то есть местными исполнительными органами. Уважаемые учителя, если у вас это, вот этот э, постулат э, выполняется не в должном объеме, я прошу вас э, обращаться в местные исполнительные органы для приведения в соответствие и исполнения местными исполнительными органами их обязательств. Также обеспечивается поддержка молодых специалистов. Установлен, установлен институт наставничества, причем наставники будут получать доплаты. Но особо я хотела бы остановиться на вопросах повышения профессионального мастерства и повышения педагогической квалификации. Не менее одного раза в пять лет учитель обязан пройти курсы повышения квалификации. Если ранее строго регламентировался перечень организаций и только очная форма курсовой подготовки, то теперь учитель вправе выбрать, как, когда и где в какой форме ему пройти курсовую переподготовку. Единственное условие, чтобы перечень тем курсовой переподготовки соответствовал утвержденному уполномоченным органам, то есть Министерством образования, тем для повышения вашего предмастерства, то есть тем курсом. Не реже одного раза в пять лет учитель имеет право повысить свою категорию. Вы знаете, что у нас буквально уже в течение двух лет процедура прохождения аттестации педагогов изменена. И самое главное, что вы можете, уважаемые педагоги, пройти аттестацию как в плановом режиме, то есть один раз в пять лет, так и можете это сделать досрочно, при наличии достижений своей профессиональной деятельности и достижений своих учеников. Это то, что дает нам право на повышение своего, своей квалификации, а, соответственно, с каждым уровнем повышения своей педагогической квалификации мы повышаем свою заработную плату. Так как это, наличие категорий дает нам право на доплаты. Далее. Одним из основных аспектов повышения профессионального мастерства – призваны стать объединение учителей-предметников, то есть создание ассоциации педагогических работников. И мне вдвойне приятно, что одной из первых в стране стала ассоциация учителей английского языка Северо-Казахстанской области. Уважаемые педагоги, я думаю, что это то, это высказывание, да, этот факт заслуживает самых главных слов признательности Альбине как лидеру и идейному вдохновителю наших с вами тех свершений, которые мы с вами сейчас проводим в нашей области. Участие в ассоциации также предоставляет определенные права и преимущества для учителей нашего региона. Ну, во-первых, это профессиональная поддержка. Поверьте мне на слово, такое есть не в каждом регионе нашей страны. Во-вторых, возможность обобщать свой опыт работы что предоставляет определенные права 
при аттестации учителей. Учителя члены ассоциации могут входить в экспертный совет по рассмотрению материалов учителей, которые а, повышают свою квалификацию, то есть аттестуются. Кроме того, а, уже сейчас прецеденты созданы. А, один из членов нашей ассоциации учителей а, английского языка Северо Казахстанской области является членом комиссии, которая прису, как раз и при, областной комиссии, которая присуждает и выносит решение о присуждении э, квалификационной категории нашим учителям. Э, поэтому я думаю, что ассоциация как раз и тот механизм, тот рычаг, который позволяет нам с вами повышать наше с вами профессиональное мастерство и повыша, э, позволяет нам регулировать э, государственную политику в сфере образования. Ну и в завершении приветственного своего адреса, такого небольшого, я хочу пожелать ассоциации только уверенных шагов вперед, признания на международном уровне, потому что признание на уровне республики у ассоциации уже есть. Работа нашей ассоциации рассматривалась и обобщалась на, на сессии Национальной академии образования имени Ибрая Алтенсарина. Смею вас заверить, такой чести удостоены далеко не все. Вот как раз Ассоциация учителей английского языка Северо-Казахстанской области, это была первая ассоциация, которая получила такой широкий отклик и такое признание в стране. Уважаемые педагоги, позвольте мне пожелать вам профессионального роста, талантливых учеников, благодарных родителей, творчества и удовлетворения от вашего такого нелегкого и такого необходимого труда. Ну а всем членам ассоциации я хочу пожелать покорение любых высот, которые для себя определила ассоциация, и, так скажем, активу ассоциации я хочу пожелать только поддержки от всех, всего учительства, особенно от учителей английского языка. И я хочу, чтобы каждый член ассоциации мог с гордостью сказать «да». Я член Ассоциации учителей английского языка Северо-Казахстанской области. Я могу практически все. Я от души вам этого желаю. Поздравляю вас с тем, что сегодняшнее мероприятие состоялось. И состоялось так, что каждый, вот я уже смотрю, да, участников достаточно много. И каждый считает, тот, кто присоединился к конференции, он считает, что да, он сегодня получит много важного, много нужного и необходимого для своего профессионального роста. Еще раз поздравляю вас с этим событием. Огромное спасибо. Thank you, Valentina, for your presentation, um, for such good words about the association. And now I'd like to extend special welcome to our guest keynote speaker, Dr. Christopher Stilwell. Dr. Christopher Stilwell has worked as a teacher educator in Egypt, Peru, and Laos, and he has taught English as a foreign language in Japan, Spain, and the US. He has numerous publications on teacher development, including two edited volumes on language teaching insights from other fields. He is a professor of English as a second language at College of the Sequoias, and he is an advisory board member for University of California, Irvine's online TSO certificate. He is currently designing teacher education programs in Brazil and Japan for the US Department of State and for the University of California, Irvine. Please give your full attention to Dr. Stilwell. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Can, can you hear me? Yes. All right. And, and you can see my slides? This is fantastic. I feel like I'm in Kazakhstan. I'm, I'm in California, but it feels like we're together. This is great. So thank you very much for the, for the wonderful uh, introduction. I'm really excited to be here. And I just want to start by saying um, good morning. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to read those, but um, good morning, everybody. Uh, for me, it's, it's nighttime, actually, so maybe I should have the American flag next to this with the stars to show nighttime and the morning sun here for Kazakhstan. Um, but it's very exciting to, to enjoy this difference in the time zones together with you. 
And I want to thank you very much uh, for, for being here. First, I want to thank the organizers for, for inviting me. I know that a tank does a lot of exemplary work with uh, supporting teachers, and I feel fortunate to have the chance to participate. I also want to recognize the organizers and everyone else who's attending the conference for the hard work you do to help students learn language effectively. I, I know you all have very busy weeks with your school commitments. You have many other things you could do with your Saturday morning, but you've chosen to join us here today. And to me, that says that you are people who care about being effective teachers and you are valuable colleagues. Your school should be grateful to you for your commitment, and I'm thrilled to be with you here today. So here's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about teacher to teacher engagement and what it is. I want to talk about connecting with other teachers, why we might do it and how. And I also want to talk about how to learn from other teachers. After that, we'll get to some practical applications. Okay, here we go. So the first one is about, let's see here, sorry, is what is teacher to teacher engagement and connection, right? And so the first thing we might think about here is that when we refer to this, we're referring to teachers getting to know one another. They're sharing ideas, resources, information, and they're providing support. Teachers can learn a great deal from and with other teachers through this kind of engagement. At the start, it involves getting together to explore a topic. You might follow a formal and structured format, or it could be informal, unstructured. You can meet face-to-face, -face, or you can interact online. And if it's online, it could be at the same time, synchronously, or asynchronously at different times, whenever people are available to catch up and contribute. Now, the next question is, why would we do this? Why would we want to connect with other teachers? Um, so, uh, Albina, I'd like to ask you that question. I wanna ask everybody, actually. Can you type some answers in, in the chat? What do you think? Why is it important to connect with other teachers? And, and while everyone's typing their answers in the chat, I'm, I'm curious, Albina, can you tell me, what do you think? Why is it important to connect with other teachers? Well, for me, the main reason I think is to learn from my peers. It's not actually like only me sharing something, but I really enjoy learning from my colleagues and from my peers. I think that's the most interesting and important for me as a teacher. Yeah, let's see what right. our colleagues think. Absolutely, yeah. And, and while, we, while you're looking, I'd say I, I totally agree that our peers have a lot of knowledge. They have experiences that we don't have, and it's so nice to learn mm -hmm. from those experiences when we can. Yeah, we have here answers like collaboration, to share and learn, experience exchange, engagement with the best specialist and sharing ideas, share and learn, exchange. Yeah, this kind of like yes, sharing enthusiasm <laughs> too. Yeah, challenge. Some, so someone says professional support. Wow. Yeah, these kind of answers we are getting. Beautiful, yeah, th those, those are great answers. They're, they're, they're similar in some ways to some of the other things that, that I would say. I, I would add th things like, let's see here, uh, professional growth, right? It, it allows for professional growth and learning, access to opportunities. Uh, we, can, we can go back, go, if we think back to the start of civilization, right? Humans have benefited from hunting together, from sharing food, fighting off common enemies, so that's important. Uh, learning through interaction. This allows us to not only learn useful things from our colleagues, but the experience gives us insight into what our students experience when they learn through interaction. And seeing this for ourselves can give us, can give us many ideas for how we might be able to do it a little better. Another thing is that relationships bring happiness. They, they're, they're good for mental health. People who have a lot of relationships, they tend to be happy, they tend to be healthier, and they even tend to live longer. I like the idea that it also provides ways to help others, which is great in two ways, because as we help others, of course, we help ourselves as we get deeper feelings of personal fulfillment and worth. Uh, the last one here is that it, it fights burnouts. So, you know, teachers, unfortunately, we, we, we have big challenges. We, we face very heavy workloads, very heavy emotional demands as we try to, to support our students. And if we don't get emotional support ourselves from connection with other teachers, it can be very difficult. But we can get social support from other teachers when we are connected with other teachers. Now, these are just a few ideas. And, and as, you, as you mentioned, Albina, there are many other ideas. So thanks, everybody. Let, let's keep going here and, and think about how. How can we connect with other teachers? And specifically, I think we can narrow it down to two areas. First, 
we could try just getting teachers together. And the second major area is we can cultivate our teacher network. And I'm gonna talk about how maybe we have a teacher network already that we, we don't even think about. So, okay, first let's start with the getting teachers together. And there are four parts to this. The first part is about specifying a goal and an activity. The next thing is to distribute responsibility and then be a leader and remove obstacles. Now let, let's go into each of those four things a little bit more closely. So if you look at the first one about specifying a goal, we, we can think of a million different ways that teachers can get together and learn from one another. But to narrow your choices, it's good to define your goals and choose a corresponding activity. So you can talk to part, potential participants and find out what are they interested in? Are they interested in reading articles or visiting classrooms or improving the curriculum? Try to select a goal that your colleagues will be eager to participate in. That's a big part of the battle right away. So some things you might do is, is think about connecting and learning, right? That's the first one here. You can strengthen collaboration and relationships with, with fellow teachers. We might have a goal to make specific improvements to your curriculum, your teaching methodology, or to your school. Now, once you've identified your goal, the next thing is to find a matching activity. And some possible activities in that area include something like an AE Live viewing party. I'll talk about what that is in just a moment. An activity called lunch and learn, group problem solving, reading discussion groups, peer observation, and lesson study. So these are all different kinds of activities. And I'm gonna be talking more about these activities as we go forward and the goals that they're matched to later in the session. But whatever your goal is, it's very useful if you can distribute responsibility. So what you wanna do is you want to find collaborators who can share the responsibility for planning. Maybe you want to distribute the topic selection or the discussion leadership to different members each time. And the benefits of this are that it makes the activity more sustainable because more people can keep things going when one person gets too busy. Also, more people feel ownership. They feel more dedicated to it. They wanna support it and keep it going because they're invested. But oftentimes, one secret to the success of any, teaching, any teacher learning activity is that there's one person, or maybe a couple, who are putting in a little bit of extra work behind the scenes to make it happen. And they're probably not complaining about it. They're just doing it. And so that's what it is to be a leader. A leader can do many crucial things to help teachers connect and learn from another, one another, such as taking care of details, like finding a place to meet in person or online, setting the schedule, and establishing a routine. You can seek support from your school's administration. Um, it, that's, that's one way you can, you can um, get support for your group. And there are many different ways this could happen. Maybe you could find a way for teachers to get a little bit more time off from classes for meetings, or maybe the school can provide food or other resources. You might need to be a little bit creative about this to think of what can your school do to help you, especially if they don't wanna give you money. But there are other ways that the schools can help you. So it's, it's fun to think about what else could they do that would be nice. Now, another way to prepare is to think about the things that might prevent teachers from participating. And that means that we need to remove obstacles, okay? Sometimes teachers are eager to get together with their colleagues. They want to collaborate and learn, but there's obstacles like you see here, time, hunger, disconnection, and they get in the way. Leaders can look for ways to address these obstacles and increase teachers' participation. Let's look at the first one, time. Now, I'm sure you recognize Teachers are extremely busy, right? And as I said, I'm, I'm so impressed that you, 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 you work Monday through Friday, everybody, and maybe your schools want you to work on Saturday too, I don't know, but whatever you're doing, you found time to be here right now, and that wasn't easy, right? You're very busy. And if a meeting like this, if we said, you have to prepare, you have to do a lot of homework before you come to this meeting, maybe you wouldn't feel comfortable participating right now, but that wasn't the situation, right? You, you're welcome to come and just, if you're ready, plug in and come join the conversation. So that's the secret here. Consider ways that teachers can learn together without a great deal of preparation. The key is to keep it simple. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I mentioned earlier the AE Live Viewing Party. So the, the US Department of State offers these weekly, viewing, these weekly sessions called AE Live, where somebody like me perhaps might give a talk, something like this perhaps. And we, we talk about things that are important to language teachers around the world. Now, what's nice is that uh, they set it up so that there are some questions you can look at, there are some readings maybe, there, there, there's some structure that they provide, 
And it's not just AE Live or, or the US State Department. Of course, IATEFL, TESOL, all the different associations offer similar things where you can join a webinar and you can, you can learn from experts around the world, right? But the nice thing, if you can make it a viewing party, either in person or just by texting each other while you're watching it at the same time, is that you can, you can join an online discussion before the event, you can look at the suggested readings, you can organize this kind of a viewing party, like I said, in person or, or texting, and then you can continue the conversation. You can discuss it afterwards, and you can use the discussion questions that are provided, or you can come up with your own. Now, as you consider time, you might also think about the timing of your meeting. Now, right now, you're, you're all having your meeting in the morning, and, and I hope you had something to eat before you joined us, and you're, you're comfortable, but sometimes, there are obstacles in, in that area as well. And so I'm talking about hunger, right? Sometimes this is an obstacle. If you schedule a meeting during a, a break time when teachers are, are really busy and, and maybe they haven't had a chance to eat all day, right? And, and I'm thinking in particular, in, in particular about a meeting that might be at times when you're face-to-face -face in your school and it's awkward to eat, right? Now, if you're online, maybe you can turn off your camera and you can eat something while you're meeting. I don't know. But at school, you really have to make that choice sometimes. And so we don't want the teachers who might participate in our group to need to make that choice. They, they shouldn't have to choose between taking care of feeding their stomach or feeding their minds, right? And so what you can do is you can offer snacks at your meeting, right? So just come with, with, with a, a few bags of, of, of something light that everybody can share or some fruit maybe, and encourage everyone else to bring something to share. In, in my experience, this is something that teachers really appreciate and it, it leads to some, some nice feelings of camaraderie. And this is also similar to another idea, the lunch and learn idea. Now this is uh, also known as an instructional idea exchange. Some people call it show and tell. Basically, it takes a number of forms, but the basic format is very, very simple. What you do is you share your lunch break with other teachers. And the idea here is that breaking bread together helps people build connection. As they eat together, teachers can discuss a particular topic, and it can be simple with minimal preparation, right? It could be something like, what are your favorite lesson ideas? Or what did you learn at the Atank conference last weekend, right? Or did you, did you read a short article? Let, let's talk about a short article. You could suggest something. It, it could even be as so simple, it could be like a PowerPoint. Maybe you have a PowerPoint from a presentation and you want everybody to look at the PowerPoint and talk about what does that mean to you, right? So those are some nice ideas, but we also need to keep in mind that there are, there's one more uh, obstacle and that's disconnection. So Dan Lorty, in a long time ago, he published a book called School Teacher, and it's a very famous kind of ethnographic work studying about what the life of a teacher was like in the United States. And his observation was that teaching is like an egg carton profession. Now, what does that mean? If you look at the picture here, you see an egg carton. We've got a bunch of eggs in there. And if you think about what an egg carton does, it separates the eggs so they don't get together, right? The last thing we want is for them to bump into each other and break and, and, and get messy stuff. That's, that's what we don't want. And teachers are kind of similar. If you think about the, the floor plan of a school, teachers go into their separate classrooms and they never really go into one another's classroom. So in a typical school day, teachers go into their own rooms and they're, they're isolated. They're separated from everybody else. They are disconnected, right? And so Dan Lurdy said, this is kind of a problem that teachers don't have that kind of connection, and it seems to be built into the whole nature of education. So when we think about this, that teachers tend to be isolated from one another as they work in their separate classrooms, then that leads to other problems, like they might feel uncomfortable discussing their teaching practices and participating in activities with colleagues. It's just, it just might feel weird to them because they, they spend so much time apart. So that's why it's very important for us to think about how we can build community. So we can fight this situation if we build community and camaraderie. And we can do that by first including everyone. And, and I, I really like this idea of what we can do here is just make sure that we give everyone individual attention. So make sure that everyone around you in your school knows that their, their presence is valued. And, and you can express that in many different ways, even in the way you, you publicize your group. If you send email, don't send an email that's just to the whole school. If you have the time, send individual emails to, the different, to all the different people. Now, I hope you don't have 300 people in your school, but if you have 30 people in your school, I'm sure you could think of a personalized message you could make to each of the 30 people, and that could be very powerful, very influential. Um, general announcements are, are less personal, right? 
Um, another thing about this is when you personalize the information, it's harder for someone to ignore it. They feel like they should at least read it and give you some kind of a response. So it's, it's really kind of a secret of success for this kind of thing. Now, another, another thing is you can, in the second bullet, use icebreaker activities, much like the ones we might use in our classes in the first days of class, when we're trying to get everyone to learn about each other. For example, we can invite people to sit in groups of four and, and make a poster or something, where they list five things that they have in common, and maybe one thing that makes each of them unique, right? We can also celebrate what makes the group valuable. We can recognize the value you get from meeting with the group and the unique contributions that everyone makes, and you can call attention to what the group accomplishes, maybe in a faculty meeting or something like that, and make sure to celebrate the accomplishments of the group. The last one here is foster feelings of safety and acceptance. Now remember, we said in the egg carton profession, teachers might feel uncomfortable, they might feel awkward, they don't really know each other, they don't feel safe sharing things perhaps. But uh, through all of the above activities, uh, and by maybe collaboratively developing ground rules for participation and for respectful disagreement, things like that, we can build community. Now, some other things we can do to, is we can make an effort to expand the personal network of teachers that we would like to collaborate with and learn from. It's so what I'm talking about here is the idea of cultivating your network. And the thing here is that some, some people, you, you might think that you, that means you have to go out and, and, and say, hello, hi, how are you to everybody you meet and be a super friendly person, but that's not necessarily the case. The truth is you already have a network. So, okay. I'm getting ahead of myself. I wanna start with a question for you actually. Can I ask you, what actions might you take to build your network? And, and while we're, so everybody please type an answer into the, into the chat. And while we're doing that, Albina, I wanna turn back to you. Albina, what do you think? What, what, what kinds of things could you do if you wanted to build your network? Huh, that's an interesting question. Um, maybe I would first uh, try to, to find uh, alike thinkers, uh, those professionals who also is interested in professional development and uh, poke around and ask people if they would like to uh, join and, you know, to have some chat, at least some kind of like professional chat, you know, about our problems we face in the classroom or in education, maybe if it's more interesting. Yeah, so this kind of like maybe finding uh, a like thinker people in my uh, community. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I, I can imagine how even, even a place like, like the conference today is a place to find people who care enough about teaching to spend their Saturday morning or yeah. maybe the whole day doing this. So you're probably going to find a lot of people like that right here today. So uh, Albina, did we have any, any other answers in the chat? Mm -hmm. We have here like built friendly and trustful relationship with all the members, first of all, uh, teacher associations, conferences to, 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 to take and share, uh, share contacts and interest spheres to find people with similar interests share problems, discoveries, cooperation. So we got these kind of answers. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, great. So, so I, I don't need to tell you, you already have a lot of great ideas here. Um, so, so the ones that I would add are the idea of being interested in people and appreciating your existing network. So when I think of this, the, the first one makes me think of a quote from Dale Carnegie. He's kind of a famous American businessman from a long time ago. He made a book called How to Win Friends and influence people. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a famous book. And, and here's what he said. He said, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. So this is a pretty interesting first step, right? Just be interested in other people, wants to learn about them, wants to ask questions and find out about, about who they are and what they do. And that's one of the secrets to building your network. Now, when we talk about this idea of being interested in other people, there are three components. The first one is we, we try to learn about other, people's, uh, other people. So maybe we ask questions, we try to hear from them. Now, if you're shy, like I, I actually am shy sometimes. And so what I do sometimes is I, I think before I go to something like this about what's a good question that I might ask other people. And I, I'm, I might think, well, every time I go to a conference, I see something that gets me kind of excited. I, I get some kind of a new idea that I want to try in my classrooms. 
So that might be my icebreaker question for other people. I might say, well, how do you like the conference so far? Have you learned anything that you're going to use in your classroom, right? And so that, that will tell me something about what they're interested in, and I might learn something very useful. It, it could be a nice opening, right? Okay, the second idea is about helping. As we learn about other people, we might look for ways that we can help because a friend in need is a friend indeed. That's an expression, right? So the idea is if somebody needs your help, you, 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 you can maybe help them and they're gonna really appreciate that. And there are lots of ways you can do this. So you're listening actively, you, you look for opportunities to help with, maybe you give them, share resources with them. Maybe you find out they're busy and you see how you can help with that. Uh, maybe you've got someone who's new at your school and you can be kind of a cultural informant, right? So somebody who already knows the culture of the school and you can kind of help them to understand, like you, faculty meetings, they don't usually start on time actually. They start um, five minutes late or it's really important to be on time for the faculty meetings, right? Th things like that, that maybe are not obvious, but, but a friend, a new friend could help with. Okay, uh, the next idea I wanna talk about is how we can appreciate, um, let me see here. Did I? Okay, no, I'm sorry, I missed one. The last one here is about being a fan. So don't be shy about expressing appreciation. If someone does something that you admire, you should tell them. You can do it face to face or in an email or a letter. It can happen with people that you work with or people that you hear about from a distance. Uh, for example, I've thoroughly enjoyed my, my engagement with, with the Association of Teachers of English in North Kazakhstan as I've prepared for this presentation. I've learned about the mission, the great work they do, bringing opportunities from places around the world to the teachers here, and the work helping students in North Kazakhstan get the best English instruction possible. I'm very impressed with the work that people like Albina and, and Dina are doing, and, and I, I think it's, it's really nice to see that Atenk makes valuable contributions to, to education here. And, they, and, and people like Albina and Dina are doing it on their own time. So, so you're kind of heroes to me, actually. I see how busy you are, but I see that you're also making some, a very nice conference like this happen at the same time. So I wanna say thank you very much for including me and, and just, I'm, I'm glad to know you. Okay, so from there, the, beyond being, being a fan of other people, another thing we can think of is appreciating our existing network, right? So we don't have to be fan, it's great to be fans of people that we don't know so well and, and to share that, but we also can kind of be fans of the people we, we really do know. And so in this case, we could think about our coworkers, right? And you can think about how the different people you work with have different strengths, unique perspectives. And it's really nice to have them as part of your, your network. They're people you know, they're people you can talk to and ask questions. You can think about the younger teachers in your group who maybe have more current knowledge from teacher education programs that they came out of. And maybe they're more in touch with what it's like to be a student. You could also think about the newer teachers in your school who maybe see everything at your school with, with fresh eyes. And then of course, there are the experienced teachers in your group who have wisdom that they can share with everybody about what works and why we do things in certain ways. The next thing we could think about in our existing network is fellow students. Now, when I say fellow students, what I mean is I think just about everybody has gone through some kind of a teacher education program, right? And so when you did that, you did that with other teachers, other, other people who were learning to be teachers, and they were fellow students at the time. And so if you keep in touch with them, they are part of your network as well. And then you could also think about former teachers that you had when you were a student. I, I, I once a few years ago, had a really nice experience going back to my old school, and I, and I visited my first grade teacher. He was about to retire, and I sat down with him and I talked about teaching. What a great conversation we had. I, I got to see things from, from a whole new perspective, from a very experienced person who was actually part of my network if I just thought about it that way. So okay, um, so these are all great ways to get new ideas, useful information, inspiration, if you can find ways to just reconnect with them and, and learn together. So now let's talk about how do we learn from other teachers? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, um, I'd, I'd like to hear from you actually again, so everybody, what are you doing? Are you doing anything in particular at your school? Are you uh, involved in anything online? Is there, is there something that you participate in that helps you to learn from other teachers? Does it happen for you naturally at your school? And, and Albina, I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn to you again to help us get started. So Albina, can you tell us like, what's one of your favorite ways that you, that you find other teachers to learn with? Uh... There is like different ways I think teachers could learn from each other, but personally for me, 
uh, sometimes, you know, it's, uh, like, uh, it's just ch chat, uh, like, it's having conversation with my, uh, with my colleague, really, it just sounds so simple, but that's really um, the way sometimes, I remember so many situations, just chatting to the, to, with my colleagues, you know, or group mates from the university, just discussing some kind of, like, issue, I was like, uh, I, I even remember, like, in my head, this kind of, like, aha moments, you know, like having, aha, that's really, that's true, you know, like uh, these kind of like moments, just uh, having a dialogue with colleagues, just talking, it's not always like mm, something like sophisticated, but just for me personally, just talking to people, talking to English teachers or other educators, just having really like professional dialogue and discussing different issues makes, uh, I learn a lot from them. Let's see what our audience says. Great. Wow, here is a great answer as I see. Having a critical a critical friend is also effective. Yeah, that's I think really amazing truth. Yeah. <laughs> Classroom observation with feedback afterwards, organizing the work workshops where we share, workshops, seminars, lesson study, uh, swap shops. I have never heard that kind of phrasing. Wow, yeah, I, I now, I, now I can see the meaning, the swap shops, interesting. <laughs> yeah, discuss different questions, collaboration, observing lessons, help to see some problems, find solutions together. Wow, yeah. Beautiful, wow. Okay, yeah, so, so, so many great ideas here. And, and some of them are, are maybe new ideas. So if you haven't heard mm -hmm. critical friend before, now you know to go to Google, Google or, or somewhere and search for critical friend. Uh, mm -hmm. Swap shop is another one to go look for, um, and and yeah. so many ideas. Lesson observation, lesson uh, peer observation, lesson study, fantastic, fantastic. And and mm -hmm. Albina, going back to your original example of how it, it can even just be informal conversations with your peers, you, you just naturally learn. Um, I'm I'm kind of a boring person at a party myself. If I go to a party, I'm I'm very shy. But if I see another teacher, suddenly I know that I have a million things in common that I can talk about. And I, I have a really good time. So, so I think that might be natural for a lot of teachers. And so I, I invite everybody to, to try all these different things. Okay, and so here are some further ideas. So you mentioned these. I heard some, someone mention collaborating. Uh, another idea I wanna talk about is discussing inclusively and what that means. I wanna talk about visiting a classroom, which is similar to what we heard about observation, but there are some variations. And I wanna talk about seizing opportunities and what that might mean. Okay, first one is collaboration. So basically the way to think of this, and this is what I heard from your answers just now, is that any shared project where you're trying to solve a problem or something together, that's a learning opportunity. We naturally learn from one another when we take on a project together, and that could be maybe norming for a test or developing a curriculum or planning an event, whatever it is, it's, it's a learning experience with colleagues. And in addition to that, we can also use some formal collaborative learning activities. And it could be the same ones that we might use in our classrooms with our students, such as group projects and jigsaw activities, because these are great ways to draw out and learn from the different kinds of expertise that our colleagues have. So these activities, they build our social relationships, they let us learn through interaction, and they help us share knowledge. Let's look at some specific activities in a moment. So the, the first thing I wanna talk about is when we're together, we wanna think about using inclu inclusive discussion practices. Okay, so this is another general principle, really. And that's anytime we're together with, with colleagues, if we're in the te a teacher's room or some kind of a public place where there, there are more than two or three of us, then find ways to get everyone to participate. And think about how you might do that in your classroom. Now, in, in our classrooms, uh, a lot of times we want our students to be speaking English a lot, because typically, the, the way I think of a language classroom, the, the teacher is not the one who's practicing their language. We want the students to practice their language, right? And so we often try to find ways to get the students to talk more than the teacher does. And so these are some, some kind of tricks that teachers can use in their classroom. And they also can work very nicely when we're talking to other teachers. So the first one is don't call on the first person to raise their hand. So if you're, if you're in, a, in a more formal setting where maybe you're doing lesson study or something like that, just be mindful 
that there might be one person who is always eager to answer every question or, or continue the conversation and be mindful that maybe someone has been a little bit quiet for some time and you might invite them to share what they think. And just, just be mindful of, of getting everyone's participation. And then the next idea is about getting multiple answers. So maybe, maybe somebody gives one solution to a problem and you can say, that's, that's a very nice idea. I, I, now, before we move on, does anybody have any other ideas, right? And so just now I, I, I said, I, I had my own ideas for collaboration, right? But I didn't give all my ideas first. I said, what are your ideas? And I'm so glad I did because I heard, I heard about swap shops and critical friends that they're not in my presentation. I didn't think of them, but you did, right? So this, that's how it works when you're collaborating with other teachers. Um, now, another thing to think about is avoiding closure. So if somebody gives an answer that sounds like a good answer, don't say good answer and move on. Keep things open. Now, in your classroom, that might, you, you might even make that kind of a game in your classroom. Maybe a student gives you the right answer and you say, hmm, oh, that's interesting. Anybody else, do you have the same answer or, or does anyone have a, a, a different answer? And that way you can kind of stimulate more conversation, explore things uh, more deeply. Uh, another idea that works well in classrooms and, and might be useful among teachers is the idea of think or writing and sharing. So very often when we are asked a question in public, it's, it's hard to come up with an answer quickly, right? And so that's why when we're teaching our classes, if we ask a question to our students, we might always hear an answer from the same student because maybe that student is really gifted about hearing your question, knowing what, that you're asking for an answer and being ready to, to put that answer out, out of their mouth, right? But most people are not really like that. Most people need a moment to think about the question and say, oh, oh, it's, it's my turn to talk now. All right, what's the question? Hmm, what do I think? We need a moment to, to get that together. And so what, what happens when we invite people to write something down first is that they have a moment or two to collect their thoughts. And then it's much easier to, to get everyone to contribute as well, because later you can say, um, you know, Dina, can you share anything that you wrote on your paper? Would you mind sharing some of that? And Tatiana, what, what, what did you write? And so that's another way to make sure we get lots of participation from many different people in our group. Okay, uh, another idea that you mentioned was observing, right? We can visit a classroom. Uh, there's nothing like seeing things firsthand. We can talk about the classroom with our colleagues, and we get a picture in our mind, but I always remember my first teaching experiences where I, I thought I knew what my colleagues were like, but then I visited their classrooms and I was totally surprised that they did things in a, in a very different way from what I, what I thought. So we, we just naturally learn so much from visiting a classroom. So one, one question though, how do you feel about that? How do you feel when, when you have to be observed? If, if, you're, if you're human, <laughs> which I think we all are, um, you might feel a little bit nervous about that. I, I know that, that I do. When, 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 if I hear that I'm going to be observed tomorrow, I, I'm, I'm partly excited because I think it's gonna be an opportunity to make a connection and maybe learn from someone, uh, get an opinion on what I'm doing. But I also feel a little, a little apprehensive, a little bit nervous, uncomfortable. Maybe this was gonna be embarrassing for me, right? So, it's important to think about how we're going to do it. And there are many different ways. Sometimes we get observed by a supervisor or someone like that, and they're judging us and they're taking notes and they're gonna tell us what we did wrong. That's not what I'm talking about here, right? Here, it's probably a little different. We might think of observation the way John Fanslow talks about it. He, he wrote a few things about it. He said, seeing you allows me to see myself differently and to explore variables that we both use. So it, it allows me to recognize what we have in common, and then we can go on a kind of shared exploration. It's not about fixing you. It's about what, do, what, what are we both interested in? It's another way to make connections. Okay, the next idea I wanna share with you is the idea about, seeing, uh, about seizing opportunities. So if we think about it, there are many times in, in, our, in our working lives when we end up with other teachers, and those are real opportunities. Now we might not think of them that way, but maybe we should. So an example would be uh, a faculty meeting, of course, or if you have a teacher's room or a language center, or if there's a coffee shop that teachers like to go to or a place to get tea or anything like that, then when you recognize where your colleagues like to go, then try to be there, try to be where other people are. Um, and then the next thing is, once you've identified that, maybe arrive a little bit early 
and maybe stay a little bit late. Now that's an especially good idea for something like a, a faculty meeting, right? If you get there a little bit early, you might have a chance to talk to somebody before it starts. If you stick around afterwards, same thing. You might have some opportunities there. Now, right now, if you're doing all your meetings on, on Google Meets or Microsoft Teams or something like that, that's a little bit harder. You might have to be creative. You might have to say, hey, everybody, I just want to let you know when the meeting's over, I'm, I'm going to stick around and, and, and have a cup of tea because I, I have a 10-minute break. So if anybody wants to stick around and, and chat, I, I, I miss you guys. It'd be really nice to talk to you, right? So that's, that's something you might need to do to be creative in the current uh, time that we're living in. Okay, another idea is be active. Just look for these opportunities to contribute and help so you can build relationships and, and people can get to know you as someone that they, that they trust and that they value. Okay, let's talk now about some practical applications. Like what, what does this look like with specific kinds of activities, specific kinds of collaborative activities that teachers could do together? And some of these are, are ones that you mentioned, right? So, so one of you mentioned solving problems together. I'm so excited to hear you say that. And I wanna talk about a specific way you can do that. Another one is the jigsaw activity. And, and the third one is lesson study. And again, you, you mentioned lesson study. I, I wanna talk about that. I, I know some of you are familiar with that already. Maybe many of you are. But I want to maybe give it a slightly different spin to think about uh, the, the benefits for teacher connection. Okay, but let's go to the first one, group problem solving. So here's a true story. I, I, was, in, I was in Laos uh, a while ago. I was a guest speaker, and I was told to give a presentation on a topic. And then I found out that the teachers didn't like that topic at all. So like the boss asked me to do the topic, and I was ready. It was something about learning online. And then I, I got to the presentation and I found out the teachers didn't like to do anything online. Okay, so I needed to have a new presentation. And so what we did is this kind of group problem solving. And it was just born of necessity for me. But I, I found out later that other people do this on purpose. So here's what it looks like. The first thing is that you pose an open question, right? So you, you might ask the group, if you've got some teachers together, some colleagues, something like, what are some com common challenges in the classroom? Like, what's, what's difficult about teaching English around here? What, 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 you have all worked in other schools and you work here. What, what's, what's different about here that makes it maybe uniquely challenging in some ways? Yeah, you have to find some nice, polite ways to, to pose the question maybe. But the, the bottom line is, what, what kind of problems can we try to solve, right? And so then the next step is, together you brainstorm ideas. You, you get together and you just try to make a list of ideas. And remember the rules of brainstorming. First rule is all ideas are okay at first. Second rule is it's okay to repeat ideas. The third rule is it's okay to repeat ideas. The fourth rule is that it's okay to build off of other people's ideas as well. So if you keep those kinds of ideas in mind, you get more participation from everybody, you get more things going. And so you, you might get some ideas like, we don't have enough time, the workload is too heavy, uh, there's a low level of English of the students, uh, the students don't seem very motivated, or I have trouble managing the classroom, right? These are all things that, that we might talk about as common challenges from the brainstorming part. What happens next? Well, let's say we have eight teachers together and we came up with these ideas and more. Well, we want to narrow it down. So the next step would be to vote on the two most interesting problems. And so maybe everybody just says you pick two and you put your little tick marks on the side and you find out which ones are the most pressing, most interesting problems. So in my example, maybe it's and the student's English level is too low, and they don't seem to be very motivated. What's next? We divide into teams. So if we're eight teachers working together, maybe we make two teams where there are four people in each team, and then each team discusses solutions and actions for one of those two problems. After a little while, maybe it could be as short as 10 minutes or it could be longer, but after a little while, the, the, the group gets back together and each of the teams shares the ideas they come up with, with that they, that they came up with together, they share them with the group. And then finally, the whole group talks about it together. They discuss these new ideas and they figure out what, what's good about them, what needs to be changed, how to modify it, and they make some plans for future actions they might take. So the whole point here is we've got teachers getting together and just having a conversation. And, and let's face it, many times it, it is kind of fun to talk about things that bother us, but not just complaining, we wanna find solutions. So this is a way to, to find solutions together and build our connection with other teachers. Okay, uh, the next one I wanna talk about is jigsaw activities. And, and maybe you're doing this in your classrooms. I'm sure you've heard about it before. The idea here is that 
Maybe you pick four simple readings on associated topics, or maybe it's four YouTube videos on something about teaching. Um, or maybe you pick one reading that has four distinct parts. It could be a reading that says something like four tips for teaching online, right? And so what happens next is you break whatever it is into four pieces. It could be four readings, could be one reading that you break into four parts, but then you distribute the readings evenly so that everyone in your group is responsible for reading only one of the four parts, right? So again, if it was a text where there's four tips, then two people will read tip one, two other people will read tip two, two other people read tip three, and the last two people read about tip four. So no one is spending a whole lot of time on the reading. They're just becoming experts on their part. But that's where it gets interesting because then everybody gets together and they, when, when, you're, when you're together at the same time, people who read the same text sit together and they come to agreement on the main points and they agree on how to summarize it. Basically, they're, they're figuring out how can they teach this to someone else because the other people in the group did not read this. And so your, your job is going to be to explain it to them, to teach it to them. And so naturally, the next step is that we mix into new groups where each member leads a discussion of a different text. As you can see in the picture here, one person talks about text one and nobody else in that group even has text one. So they listen, they take notes and they learn about it. And then the person with text two goes next and so on. So this is obviously a great activity for the classroom, but it's also very useful for, for teachers, especially when you think about the fact that we're so busy, we don't really have time to do a lot, but maybe if we break some, something down and just look at a part of it, that might be helpful. Okay. The last kind of activity I want to talk about is the one that you might be most familiar with, and that is lesson study. Now, we mentioned that teachers are often apprehensive. They're, they're uncomfortable about being observed, but they might be more comfortable if the observation is not really focused on them and, and like their teacher personality or how effective they are at calling on students or whatever it is, if you're evaluating the lesson instead. And imagine this, it's not just the teacher's lesson, it's the lesson that everybody shares. So everybody has a shared responsibility on this, right? And so just to refresh your memory, in case you don't remember about lesson study, it's the, the idea here is a team of teachers develops a lesson that is useful for all of their classes. Now, I, I used to teach in Japan and, and I worked with teachers from, from all over the world and it was really nice. We all agreed, in, in my case, we all agreed that our students wanted to learn from watching movies. They wanted to learn vocabulary. And we thought, okay, how can we help them? How can we give them strategies to learn English from movies? So together we developed a lesson about it. And after, after that, uh, we, we sort of all agreed on a basic idea for a lesson. We found a video clip, we found questions and a handout. We made it all together. And then I was the first teacher. And so I used the lesson in my class and my colleagues sat in the back of the room and they listened and they, they took notes. But they weren't really taking notes about like, is my hair messed up or, or do, do I talk funny? They were taking notes about the lesson, right? And they were taking notes about the ideas that we had already shared. And so that was gonna be the basis for our conversation. So the next thing was after class, we got together and we talked about the lesson and it wasn't about me, it was about the lesson and how can we make the lesson better? Again, lots of teacher connection, lots of learning from each other, but it's a, maybe a more comfortable way to be observed by your colleagues. Now, of course, the next step is that you repeat these steps, right? So you talk to your colleagues, you figure out, well, let's change some things, and then you do it again, but somebody else in the group will teach it in their class next. Uh, and, and you can do that three, four, however many times you want. Um, so that's the idea with lesson study. All right, well, I, I see we're, we're getting close to the end of my time here, so I'm gonna sum up now, and, and I just wanna say that uh, basically, there are four key areas of the presentation we can think about, right? The first one in the top left here is that as we talk about teachers learning with other teachers, we want to keep in mind the importance of finding ways to hold activities that will bring teachers together. We can do that when we have specific goals, when we exercise different kinds of leadership, like maybe, maybe one person's kind of the leader, but, but in a way, everyone's a leader. They all share it. And also, if you can be a leader and find ways to address the obstacles, right? That's in the top right. And we know these obstacles could be things like the time, and, and hunger and feeling disconnected. In the bottom left, we, we can see that we get more opportunities to collaborate and learn with other teachers when we have a healthy network. And we can keep that network alive if we nurture it, if we help it grow through our interests in other people, and if we celebrate the value of the people that we already know throughout our lives. Okay, and finally, 
when we see context for building our network and learning, it's good to remember the power of collaborating, of using inclusive discussion techniques, visiting classrooms, and just grabbing every opportunity we can to do things. So it could be faculty meetings, it could be having conversations at a place like the conference today, but don't miss those opportunities. Yes, teaching is said to be an egg carton profession because teachers tend to be naturally isolated from each other. And they sometimes burn out, or if they're eggs, then they, they crack up. And it's a shame because teachers have so much to learn from their peers. But as we build our network and as we interact with other teachers, we enhance our relationships. And, and of course, these relationships are essential for many things throughout our lives. They're a key to our happiness and our health. And for teachers, they increase our access to opportunities. They allow us to expand our knowledge. They help us to develop as professionals. In short, these relationships help us continue to be effective and enthusiastic teachers. As we build networks and help teachers connect with one another, we make a great contribution to the field because we're increasing our fellow teachers' satisfaction and effectiveness. All right, that's it for me. You'll see my email address on the last slide. Please don't be shy. Uh, please go ahead and write if you have any questions or comments, or if you just wanna help me build my teacher network, I'll be very, very happy to hear from you. And thanks for spending your time with me today. I've enjoyed connecting and learning from the comments you've shared, and talking about this topic has really increased my happiness. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you very much. We have received so many uh, uh, comments in our chat box, uh, appreciating your your presentation. I think uh, many people that now feel the same. What I felt like three or four months ago when first I watched your American English webinar on Facebook um, through the US Department of State's workshop uh, series. Uh, Chris presented there about teacher to teacher engagement. And when I saw that presentation, I was like, wow, our teachers, our people have to see this presentation. This is just great. This is about networking, association, collaborating with each other, learning from each other, sharing uh, to each other. So thank you so much, Chris, for taking your time, having uh, um, uh, making this presentation today for us, even it's late night for you in the US. Thank you so much, uh, Kazakhstani people. Uh, I wanted to say North Kazakhstani people, but according to my data I have, we have now people, uh, English teachers across all Kazakhstan, not only in North wow. Kazakhstan. So North uh, Kazakhstani English teachers now really, I think, appreciating. I see here a bunch of messages thanking you. Uh, thank you so much. I can't Thanks. express more than enough our gratitude for your time and for your presentation, inspiring uh, presentation to collaborate with each other. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's been a real, real pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Stilwell. And it, um, now it gives me great pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to our next guest, a keynote speaker, Richard Harrison, who is an author, publisher, and teacher trainer based in Oman and also London. He has work, worked extensively throughout the Middle East region for more than 25 years. And he also lived in Moscow for three years working for British Council at the English for Specific Purposes Consultant for the Russian Federation. Uh, Richard Harrison is the founder of Canfor Publishing. His many English language teaching publications include framework, academic writing, and critical thinking. Uh, also, he's co-author of the popular Oxford University Press series, series Headway Academic Skills. Uh, Mr. Harrison, welcome, and we are thrilled to, uh, to listen to your presentation. Thank you very much, Dina, for that nice introduction. And thank you also to Albina and to the rest of your organizing committee, and uh, also to Interpress, who invited me to come here. So it's very nice to be back in Kazakhstan, um, although it's only virtually. This time last year, I was actually in um, Kazakhstan and I had a lovely time. So hopefully I'll be able to get it back again very soon. Um, now I'm going to see if I can share my screen. If you just bear with me for a moment. Right, can you see the screen everybody? I hope so, <laughs> otherwise we're in trouble. Okay, right. Well, I'm going to be talking about critical thinking, 
and how we fit it in alongside the other academic skills into our language programs. So let me just give you the, a brief guide of the contents. So I'll just talk very quickly about what critical thinking is and then um, trying to relate it to the other academic skills. And then I'll look at ways that we can introduce critical thinking into our uh, program, alongside our program, perhaps. So I'll be looking at, well, first of all, thinking about thinking. Then I'll be looking at the syllabus, what goes into a syllabus. And then finally, I'll be looking at some practical activities that even if you can't get a, a critical thinking strand into your language program, at least you can feed in these critical thinking activities, the very flexible activities that can be five or 10 or 20 minutes into your existing programs. Okay, so let's uh, press on. Um, just a few comments about critical thinking. It's a type of thinking alongside everyday thinking, scientific thinking, creative thinking, and so on. Um, everyday thinking is the kind of thinking that we do throughout the day, random thinking where thoughts float into our mind, unfocused, but um, critical thinking is very much not random. It's very conscious thinking. It's voluntary. We decide to do it. it it's, um, it's also um, reasonable thinking as well. And so reasonable by reasonable, I mean, it's based on reason. So we use reason to decide what to believe or what to do. And it's also reflective, meaning we give it deep thought over a period of time. Now then, um, it's an integral part of academic life. So everything that a student does at school or university or college, involves critical thinking, whether it's writing an essay or reading a textbook or analyzing data or taking part in a, a discussion, they should all involve um, critical thinking. And one more point about it, critical thinking encourages us to be skeptical and doubtful. Now, skepticism and doubt, I think, are positive things. It's not the same as being negative about the world or cynical, but it actually is a good thing. It leads on to us asking questions. And really asking questions is the core of critical thinking. This is really the aim uh, of what we're trying to teach our students to do, to ask questions. And not just factual questions, but what we might call difficult questions or searching questions or probing questions or even inconvenient questions. In the past, some of the questions people asked were dangerous. So for example, if they challenged the conventional wisdom that um, the earth is the center of the universe, in the past that was quite a dangerous uh, question to ask. But it's throughout history by asking questions like this that we've advanced our knowledge in all of these fields. And in that way, our knowledge base uh, expands. So how can we introduce critical thinking into our existing programs, our language programs? And I like to use this image of a diamond as, as something where we should focus on for our students' thinking. Why a diamond? Well, it's precise, it's clear, it's sharp, it's incisive, even sparkling. So this is the kind of thinking that we want to get our students um, to adopt in their academic life. Instead of what we often have, this rather muddled thinking that we engage in, throughout the day, woolly thinking or lazy thinking. And I use a cloud image to, to show this. So how do we get from that to that? So I've got three possible suggestions here and they are alternative approaches or approaches that can be used altogether, depending on 
on your circumstances. So first of all, get students to think about their thinking. So this is metacognition. Get, and I'll give you an example of a task we can give them. The next one is to introduce a syllabus into your existing program. And the third one, uh, critical thinking activities, practical activities, five, 10, 20 minute activities that can fit into whatever you're teaching at that time. So let's look about uh, thinking about thinking. <laughs> and I've used this image from uh, one of my books. Um, here, a man is stepping outside his body and he's looking at himself uh, in an objective way as he is studying. In this case, he seems to be reading and taking notes. So what can we learn from this? Well, thinking about thinking or metacognition involves noticing the way that we learn or we perform a task. Knowing ourselves, knowing what we are good at and what we need to improve. And then finally, planning what we need to do to complete a particular task or to solve a problem. So how do we actually get students to think about their thinking? Well, here's one idea, and I'm sure you can come up with a lot of others, being very practical teachers. Um, think about a big decision you had to make recently, a new job, a new home, ending a friendship or a relationship, etc. Okay, so this is a task for two or more students, maybe a small group. And this is a kind of worksheet, but really it's more of a discussion guide. So what issue did you need to decide about? What steps, if any, did you go through before you made your decision? And then finally, how could you improve your decision making process? So that's one example. As I said, you could come up with a lot of other tasks like this that get students to, to think about their thinking. Right, let's go on to syllabuses, critical thinking syllabus. Uh, now I think of a syllabus, uh, sorry, as, as critical, I think of critical thinking as being in fact a bundle of skills. It's not just one skill, it's a bundle of skills and as are the other uh, academic skills. So reading is not just one skill, as we know, there are a number of different sub-skills in reading. And the same in writing and listening, speaking, study skills, and so on. By the way, I've included critical thinking as one of the academic skills. It can also be considered to be one of the 21st century skills, but that's another, uh, another talk. Uh, another subject. Um, I've come up with this classification just to clarify the way I think about it. So critical thinking, language skills and study skills are all academic skills alongside research skills, for example, and maybe one or two others. And then the language skills you are familiar with, reading, writing and so on. Okay, so let's come back to critical thinking skills. Let's think of the sub skills that we could put into our syllabus. And under arguments and opinions, um, building strong arguments, looking at both sides of an argument and supporting an opinion with examples, evidence, reasons, and sources. Um, I should have said, I'm here in, uh, in Muscat in Oman, and some years ago I was teaching at the German university here, and my students were very good at having opinions, they had lots of opinions, and they were quite um, emotional, and they used exaggeration with their opinions. They were not good at using examples, evidence, reasons, and sources. They weren't good at supporting their opinions. So that's something that had to be worked on. Here's another skill, sub-skill, um, <clears throat> defining terms. So if we're going to be discussing, for example, poverty, then we need to have a very exact definition of what poverty is. 
and we can use the United Nations definition, uh, poverty is an income of having, uh, having an income of $2 a day or less. So the same with any other topic, um, for example, being overweight or success or democracy, uh, stereotypes, any of these topics, we need to have a clear definition. And it's not just for the benefit of the reader, it is the benefit of us. It makes our thinking clearer if we know exactly what we are talking about. Okay, so let's move on. Other, under the areas, other skills under the heading of data. So commenting on data, asking questions about data, linking cause and effect, <clears throat> and avoiding false correlations. Of course, just because two things happen at the same time doesn't mean to say that there's a causal relationship between the two. Uh, so that's something that has to be uh, pointed out to students. Um, problem solutions, identifying, defining a problem, finding, evaluating solutions, and then using criteria to decide which solution you like best. For example, if you have to get a new car, uh, the criteria might be price, um, I don't know, color, fuel efficiency, reliability, and so on and so forth. And then you put them in a, a ranking, which you think are the most important for you. So that's an intelligent way of making a choice, of choosing a solution to a problem. Um, others, a few others here, identifying groups and classifying. Well, I, when I gave, gave my little classification a, a few minutes ago, that was an example of critical thinking. I was taking some items, skills in this case, and deciding what they kept, had in common and how we could organize them into a classification. Uh, analyzing a process or a procedure. So for example, a process like um, the production of tea, if we break it down into very small steps, it becomes easier to understand and easier to explain. Uh, or a procedure like sending a parcel from um, Kazakhstan to me here in Oman, for example, what's the procedure? What steps would you go through in order to do that? And then distinguishing fact and opinion, very important, and thinking about thinking we've already uh, discussed. So these are some elements that we could put into a uh, critical thinking syllabus. So we could set about writing our own syllabus and putting that alongside the existing program in our courses. Uh, I'm going to show you from one of my books, the syllabus that I did, there's the critical thinking strand. So that goes alongside writing skills and the language focus. So you've got all of those uh, sub skills there in, in, that, in that strand. Um, I just mentioned Headway Academic Skills. I was one of the writers of that course. And also that has um, the uh, academic skills in, in, very, in a number of strands. First of all, one of the elements of the course is reading, writing and study skills. So here is the read, reading component, there is the writing component and the sub skills that go with that. And then the other element is listening, speaking and study skills. And again, there's a listening strand, all those sub skills of listening and a speaking strand as well. Okay, let's go on now to the practical activities that you might be able to use in your classrooms. I think it's always good to have something practical that you can take away. Um, and I've come up with a number of activities, probably most of these that you are familiar with. What I've tried to do is to line them up on the right hand side with the skills that they are trying to practice. So, for example, puzzles or jumbled text, 
uh, which are kind of puzzle, a linguistic puzzle. These train the brain, uh, we could say. Brainstorming, well, that's creative thinking. That's getting students to think outside the box. Role play, very familiar, but we can use that to identify problems and evaluate solutions, as I mentioned a minute ago. I like the idea very much of class debates, dividing a class into teams, um, and developing arguments on a particular topic, for and against, for example. So building a strong argument to back their opinion, the point of view that they're trying to put forward. And then structured discussions reflecting on a topic. For example, the topic of uh, are stereotypes sometimes useful? So in order to get a better discussion, I think it should be structured into a number of different steps or questions, sub-questions that you could ask. And then self-reflection tasks, thinking about thinking we've looked at. Here are a few more. <clears throat> um, quizzes I've set up, a test for lazy thinking. Sometimes we think we know um, a fact or some facts about the world, but in fact, those facts are not correct. We have the wrong information. And the quiz can be quite, um, a carefully designed quiz can be quite good at um, exposing this and getting students to realize that they always need to go to data. They can't just assume what they've always thought. Uh, reading text, distinguishing fact and opinion. Uh, the ones in blue here, I'm going to go through in a little bit more detail and give you some examples of uh, tasks. So scam emails, advertisements, misleading data, and scientific experiments, okay? So if you're like me, um, you probably get a lot of scam emails and you get fed up with them, they're annoying, and you, you delete them straight away. And then I started to think, well, wait a minute, let's turn the tables on these people sending these emails. Um, they're actually um, quite useful because they are a rich source of critical thinking activities. So I deleted this email. Why did I decide to delete it? What, what uh, raised my suspicions? And I've put in red here some of the things that I found a little bit suspicious. Um, so, dear customer, it's supposed to be from PayPal. So, dear customer, so they didn't know my name, for example, so that's a bit suspicious. Uh, we detected alert activity, that's strange language. Uh, we need to confirmation. Well, I think you can see that's incorrect. So, will a big company like PayPal send out uh, emails that gram are grammatically incorrect. I don't think so. Okay, what do they want you to do? They want you to click on these links and then we don't know what would happen if we did. Here's a worksheet and I think this could be used with any scam emails. It's very simple, very basic. You might want to come up with something more sophisticated uh, tailored to a particular email. But this serves a purpose, I think. So what does the sender want you to do? Do they want you to reply? Do they want you to send money? Do they want you to click on a link? Uh, why are you suspicious? And I've just explained the reasons why I was suspicious there. Here's another one. Um, this is from Dr. Adrian Frost. And the, the, the company here is quite, um, it's an, a genuine company, I checked. And that's their address in London. But he uses his personal email. And basically, he wants to give me a lot of money, which is very kind of him. But um, he doesn't know my name. He just says, hello. That's very suspicious. Some strange language here. During the eastern city of Benghazi insurgency, and then he's made a mistake in the number here, in the punctuation. There should be a comma after 300 and not a full stop. So if he's a financial manager, he shouldn't make mistakes like that. 
uh, and so on and so forth. I mean you, uh, and a, some more odd language uh, further on. So um, going back to that worksheet, again, that would be suitable for use with this. And there are many, many, some of them more sophisticated than this, and you're really not sure. So that's a very good way, I think, of teaching critical thinking. Another good way uh, is using advertisements. Okay, <clears throat> so why advertisements? Well, advertisements are everything we don't want our students to be when they're um, writing academic essays, for example, or taking part in a discussion. They are subjective, they use emotion and exaggeration, they make misleading claims. They, they give no evidence, usually, and sometimes they're not truthful. So we've got a lot of scope here for, for critical thinking activities. Let me give you a, an, an example. Now, this invites lots and lots of questions. And as I come back to the point I made at the beginning, this is the core of critical thinking, that we need to get our students to ask questions, searching questions, demanding questions. So is this really the same person, the person on the left, the person on the right? Uh, how do you get from the left to the right in, in a minute? How many minutes? How many weeks? How many months? Um, what, what evidence is there? And so on and so forth. There's a grammatical mistake I'm sure you've spotted. Uh, it should be uh, fewer wrinkles, but we'll ignore that, not less wrinkles. Um, again, a very basic worksheet, what claim is the advertiser making? So that they always make a claim, so that's important. And then think of three critical questions you could ask the advertiser. Again, you can come up with your own more sophisticated worksheets, I'm sure, if you wanted to. Okay, here's some more. I mean, there's a lot of fun to be had out of these, you know. This is supposed to be a, doc, uh, a doctor, but we know he's not a doctor because he's a drawing. So we're not, we're not stupid. But um, they, they claim that 20,000 doctors say that these cigarettes are less irritating and that it protects your throat. They protect your throat. So again, lots and lots of questions you can ask here about that. And here's another one, a more modern one. Um, Duracell, the batteries last even longer. Well, longer than what? Uh, again, um, where's the evidence? Uh, is it longer than old batteries? Longer than um, other brands of battery? And so on. And then another one that claims that 7up is good for babies. I don't know about that. And then, of course, these that have sales and uh, we always have to be suspicious when we see this, up to, up to 50% off. So maybe one or two items have 50% off, maybe the others only have 10% off or 20% off. Uh, again, a lot of questions, a lot of scope with um, advertisements for sales. Okay, quickly on to data. Um, there's a lot of data around, um, and I hate to mention um, COVID-19. I'm sure we're all tired of it and tired of the subject, but it is a very rich source of data, and we can use some of this data to practice critical thinking. A lot of data we come across it can be inaccurate, incomplete, lacking in context, and possibly untruthful as well. Let me give you a couple of quick examples. As I said, I don't want to spend a lot of time on COVID. Um, so COVID cases by country, um, I'm not quite sure what date this is. Um, so here, the United States, you look at that and you think, oh, the United States is doing very badly. It's got 432,000 cases and the others not doing so badly. <coughs> Um, but they've not taken into account the size of the countries. Of course, it's very basic. Different countries have different populations, size populations. So if we look at that, then we find the United States is actually 
not that bad. It's, it's further down the list anyway, if you can see that. So that's an example of how we can use that to practice critical thinking. Here's another one. Uh, this is very recent. This is just the last 30 days, um, deaths from COVID-19 in the UK. So it, the picture looks rather grim, doesn't it? It's sort of uh, a month ago, it was about 10 or so, and then it started to rise. And now there are about 70, 75 deaths um, a day. So it looks like a very worrying trend. And, but if we look at the context, I don't know if you can see all of that, that actually compared to what happened in April and March, the rise we've had in the last month is really quite insignificant. I mean, I hate to use that word because people are dying, but it's, it's not as, as major as it was in March and April. So that's an example of bearing in mind the context, the wider context of the data. And I'm not saying whether, you know, policies on COVID are right or wrong. I'm just saying that we need to look at the context when we make uh, decisions about data. Right, I think I'm running out of time. So please stop me if I'm talking too much, but I just want to finish this last example. Uh, Albina, if you don't mind. Um, so uh, this is a, sorry, that was for, for data. This is the scientific method, which is central to critical thinking. It's central to science. Very important that we set up a hypothesis and then we try to test the hypothesis through uh, an experiment and then we present our results. So this is very standard. Those of you who have a scientific background will know all about that. So how can we use this in the classroom? Well, it's very difficult to do the experiment. You need a lot of time. But what we can do is get students to think about how they would uh, carry out an experiment to test a particular hypothesis. So here's an example. I got this from the internet. There are lots of questions like this, simple scientific experiments that you can find on the internet. So, <clears throat> do mice grow larger if they are given vitamin C? Okay. So, we give this to our students in small groups, and they have to think about, well, what steps would we take in order to answer this question? And we give them time to go away and think about that. Um, so, here's a possible answer. First of all, they would learn about mice and learn about vitamin C. And then they'd come up with a hypothesis. In this case, mice grow larger if they are given vitamin C. And then the experiment, well, I think that's quite straightforward. You have two groups of mice and you give a tasty diet for, for the one group of mice, uh, something they like. And then with the other group, you do the same, another tasty diet, but you add vitamin C. And you add them, at the, sorry, you weigh them at the beginning, you weigh them at the end, and then you come up with your results and your conclusion. <clears throat> if you're, in case you're interested, the hypothesis is not correct. It doesn't make any difference, apparently. Okay, so um, conclusion now, very rapidly. Critical thinking is an important academic skill, and I showed you how it, I think it fits in with the other academic skills. It's something that should be taught explicitly. It isn't something we can say, oh, they will pick it up along the way. <clears throat> it needs to be taught explicitly, I believe. And we can do this in three ways, thinking about thinking, adding a syllabus, or feeding classroom activities into an existing program. Or we can use a combination of these three approaches as well, depending on our particular teaching situation. <clears throat> so finally, I just want to show you the books where I've put my ideas on this. Um, so framework first is the lower level, and then framework is the higher level, academic writing and critical thinking. 
And also, as I said, I was an author of the Headway Academic Skills. So these are the books, um, Reading, Writing and Study Skills, and then the Listening, Speaking and Study Skills as well. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very sorry, Albina, for running over time. Um, here are my details if you want to uh, get in touch. Uh, any questions that there isn't time for now, um, please uh, feel free to um, send me a question to contact me. And I look forward to being back in Kazakhstan, uh, really, in, in the near future. <laughs> All this is over. Yeah. Massive, massive thanks, Richard, for your presentation. Uh, yeah. I think our chat was really uh, like sending like lots of uh, thoughtful comments and feedback on your presentation. I think it's really due to the reason that your, your presentation is really useful and practical for teachers, especially for me personally, I really liked your up-to-date uh, ideas about email scam. I think it's really like topical right now, so, so, like media literacy, digital literacy. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your experience and knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you, and I look yeah. forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. We hope to see you in Kazakhstan. Thank you. Yes, I hope so, too. Just <laughs> looking day. forward. Yeah. Okay, dear colleagues, we will have now 15, uh, 15, uh, 10 minute break. Uh, we'll have 10 minute break till 12 o'clock. You can stay in the, in the conference, just um, uh, have rest, uh, then come back please at 12 uh, at twelve uh, o'clock. I'll, I'll remind you, I'm reminding you again that uh, your e-certificates will be uh, uh, sent via, uh, you need to complete the Google form in the end of the, at the end of the conference, we'll provide a link. Please uh, complete that link and you will get your certificate within next week. All the presentations uh, will be uploaded on our website. We also will um, uh, let you know through your emails, uh, also uh, like kind of like announcement uh, uh, via emails. Okay, I don't want to keep you more. Please have rest. We'll have 10 minute break and then we'll see you at 12 o'clock. Thank you for your attendance. My name is Tatiana, and I would like to start our second part with such questions. What can we do as teachers to help our students in today's digital context? How to make our lessons more interactive? And I'm sure that Stanley Yashov will answer these questions. Get ready. That's done. Thank you. 
so wait a bit. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So can can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, so can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, I'm really proud uh, of being honored to open the second part uh, of the conference. Uh, my name is Dastan, and uh, uh, today we will talk about. So, I am English teacher in Nazarbayev Intellectual School. Uh, so, also I am school coordinator of sharing the best experiences. Uh, and uh, this year I have been uh, chosen as Microsoft expert. Okay, this is the short introduction about me. Uh, so, and uh, this presentation is about interactive lesson using Nearpod. So, Nearpod is uh, is a platform or a website uh, where you can create uh, presentations like PowerPoint, uh, but with some interactive. Um, some I interactive tasks, okay? Um, so, uh, this presentation, so we'll start with a registration process and, um, and we'll finish with analyzing students' results. Um, so maybe you know uh, about Nearpod. Uh, and uh, to, to start, Okay, to start creating uh, your interactive lessons. Uh, first, uh, you should go to www.nearpod.com. Okay, and uh, you have to sign up uh, as a teacher. Okay, uh, so here Nearpod gives you so several opportunities uh, to signing up. So the first one is sign up with your Google account. You can sign up with your Office 365 account. Or you can enter your personal information by yourself. So I guess the first two options, they are really convenient for us because all of us have um, Google accounts, okay? So, and here, this is the, after your, your registration, this is, uh, this is the main uh, page of the, um, of the website and uh, we will focus on creating your presentation, okay, your lesson. Uh, so first, uh, you should click to create, and um, you should create your lesson. You start creating your lesson, okay. So uh, this is the short introduction. So uh, unfortunately, I have only 15 minutes, yeah. Uh, so and this is the like short introduction of uh, the near pot. So like general, yeah, brief introduction. So, and here, uh, and here you can uh, you can start creating your presentation. So, uh, first you have to title your lesson, and uh, you are ready to to add your first slide. Okay. Uh, so, when you click to add a slide, here you have two options. So, uh, it's adding a content and adding an activities. Uh, so. Uh, in content, you can add video, you can add uh, slides like PowerPoint slides with uh, with title and subtitles. You can add some web content, just copy and paste the URL address of any website. Um, just uh, and uh, then you can add a Nearpod 3D. It's uh, like small figures, 3D figures of different things. Students can rotate them anywhere that, uh, that they want. Um, next is simulation. It's kind of um, kind of laboratory, yeah. So online laboratory. It's for for mainly for um, science science uh, teachers. So next is VR field trip. So I like this option. Uh, it is uh, when you add a 365 photo, a 360 degree photo. Okay. Um, also, students can rotate anywhere that they want. Next, uh, you can add BBC video. 
then you can add sway sway it's uh, it's kind of presentation yeah like like uh, like PowerPoint next it's slideshow it's adding uh, adding a PowerPoint presentation then you can add an audio and PDF document okay this these are the options uh, to adding a content um, in your uh, in your presentation okay the next option is activity so as I said uh, an airport gives you an opportunity to create interactive presentations so and um, you can do it by adding some activities okay so the first one uh, is time to climb it is it's a game okay like Kahoot so maybe you know uh, you know this game Kahoot and this is the same uh, just just add some questions okay create questions and share them with your students and this this is and students will play this game okay time to climb the second one you can add the um, open-ended question just give a question students type the answers uh, matching pairs yes matching activity quiz it's a multiple choice activity with a b c d questions flip grid flip grid it's uh, you, you maybe uh, you know that uh, flip grid so we are using Flipgrid um, in speaking activities. Okay, students record their answers, uh, record a video with their answers, and send them uh, to uh, their, their teachers. Draw it, okay? I use this option uh, when I ask students to underline some keywords, uh, maybe underline the topic sentences, um, supporting sentences, okay, draw it. Uh, next is collaboration board. Collaborate board. It's um, brainstorming. Okay, when brainstorm, when you need a brainstorming, uh, you can use it. So students share their ideas with everyone. Next is poll. Poll. It's a uh, research questions. Yeah, you can add the research questions. Uh, fill in the blanks. Fill in the blanks. Uh, and memory test. Okay, these are the options to activities okay to make your uh, your presentation interactive so imagine that you have created the lesson okay it's a, for grade seven and um, after adding your your slides um, you can share you can you have three options you can share it with your uh, colleagues uh, then you can preview the lesson uh, and you just you can just save and exit Okay. Um, and when you are ready to start your lesson, okay, uh, also you have three options. Okay, the first one is live participation. It's live lesson in Zoom. Um, I don't use Zoom. Uh, that's why uh, I choose the second option, just live participation or live lesson. And the third option is um, when you share the presentation and students um, complete the task by themselves anytime that they want. Okay, it's not life life lesson. So choose one and or two. Okay, if you use Zoom, choose one. Choose the first one. Uh, and here, uh, here you can see two like two windows. Uh, yeah, the the left one is to it's teachers view. Uh, the right one is students view. So here. Uh, you can see that from teacher's view, uh, when you are starting your lesson, you have to join students to your lesson. And the first uh, option is uh, entering a code. Okay, students uh, go to to the website join.nearpot.com uh, and enter uh, the code. Okay, and the second one is, so I use this, uh, this thing because it's more convenient for me. Um, I just copy and paste the link, okay? And from the right side, you can see that students can just copy and paste it in their windows. Uh, so after after entering, joining the lessons, they, they have to type their, answer, uh, their names, okay? And uh, you can see that we have, here we have two students. Yeah, Arman and Dastan, okay? Um, 
So uh, this is the example of uh, of an activity. Yeah, it's open-ended question. So would you like to be a YouTuber or YouTube blogger, and why? So and here you can see from students' view, you can see that Arman is is typing his answer when and when he is ready, uh, he should submit. Okay, submit his answers, and after submitting, from teacher's view, you can see his answer. Okay. And here you can see that Arman is uh, has submitted his answer, but Dastan uh, didn't do it yet. Yeah. So and uh, it gives you uh, a chance to manage your uh, your classroom. Okay. To manage your uh, your lesson. Okay. Here you can see who is answering and um, who is not doing it. Okay. Um, when your lesson has finished, okay, you can uh, click to near pod, and here you have two options. The first is report. Um, ask uh, the website to send you a report, uh, and website uh, will send it to the website that you have signed uh, up, okay. Uh, and um, then you can add end the session, okay. So when you're asking a website uh, to send you a report, so and this is the example uh, of it. So uh, they will send you a PDF document with all the answers, with the students' name, students' list, there was the percentage of their participation. Okay, and here you can see the correct and incorrect answers of the students. After the lesson, uh, using this uh, report, uh, you can uh, analyze analyze their answers and give them feedback, yeah, personal feedback after the list. So, and as I said, um, this is the brief, yeah, brief introduction uh, on uh, this website. So, if you are interested in uh, in it, uh, I. Mm, you are more than welcome to visit my website. I will send uh, this link uh, in in a chat. Okay. Um, so there you can you can find some tutorials uh, on this uh, on Nearpod. And uh, for students, uh, you can uh, you can find some additional activities for your students. Okay. Uh, so I guess yeah. So 15. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your attention. Love English. Goodbye. So stay healthy. Thank you so much, Dastan. Thank you. Uh, hundreds of digital tools have been created with the purpose of giving uh, autonomy to our students. Uh, for uh, com uh, com bettering communication between teachers and learners. Now, Ala Gabrilova is going to present a collection of her favorite digital tools. Get ready for the presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Ala Gabrilova and I'm a teacher of English in the first city IT Lyceum. I have been working as a teacher for over 10 years and now I would like to share my experience with you. Practical use of the most popular web services. Being in the constant search of efficient methods of teaching English online and involving students in the process of learning, I came up with several ways to make the distance learning a more valuable experience. I would like to share these findings with my colleagues at the conference who also struggle in these challenging times. Here are some bullet points of my presentation. Classification of digital resources according to language learning skills. Using Kahoot or quizzes as means of involving students in active learning. Using Google Classroom to manage the groups of students and giving personal feedback. We all know that involve and motivate students is not an easy task for every teacher. To be honest, it's one of the most challenging things that each of us has ever faced, not only on the early stages of teaching career, but every time a newcomer enters a classroom. Coronavirus pandemic made us search for such tools that could replace face-to-face -face process of teaching and at the same time remain highly efficient.
The definition says that digital is relating to computer technology, especially the Internet. So in this session, I would like to share my personal experience of using so-called digital resources. And I would like to begin with classification of digital resources according to language learning skills. I would like to mention speaking, writing, and use of English. If the, uh, let's begin with speaking skills. If the groups you teach have three hours of English a week, then you know how hard it is to help learners overcome the language barrier. After being closed for quarantine, speaking practice has suffered more than any other skill. It took me a long time to work out the strategy of developing the skills, even staying behind the computer screen. And the first thing that I would like to share is Zoom with its breakout rooms and um, you, in combination with websites like Quizzes or Kahoot. Several tips on how to use this option. In order to conduct online discussion in groups of three or four, to have a chance to listen to every pupil in a group and not get bored with listening to everybody's answers. We are limited in time and being behind the computer screen doesn't fully allow to keep the track of what every pupil is doing during the lesson. Let's be honest, not everybody can concentrate on what is going on at the lesson, even being at the real offline lesson. So what is this to say about online? It might be a good idea to work in smaller groups. They are easier to control. Whenever I want to discuss a text, I split students into groups. While I'm in one of the classrooms, other students wait for me doing another task. You also using also one of the websites like quizzes with immediate feedback. It allows me to control what they are doing to monitor their results and identify their weak points. The second uh, web service is Flipgrid. Flipgrid is a website that allows teachers to create grids to facilitate video discussions. Each grid is like a message board where teachers can post questions called topics and their students can post video responses that appear in a tiled grid display. Grids can be shared with classes or small groups or any collection of users interested in a common strand of questions. Then, one of my favorites is WhatsApp voice messenger messages or any other messenger or email which have access to the um, voice mails. Um, some exam practice tasks require describing and comparing pictures or photos. At the preparatory stage, when stu students still need time to get ready, it is a good idea to allow them to record their speech and then send to the teacher. They can listen to their own voices, analyze their mistakes, and assess their performance, the range of vocabulary, the structure, intonation, and pronunciation. For me as a teacher, it is also a more productive method of assessing weak points and giving more detailed feedback. If we are talking about use of English, my favorite is lifeworksheets.com. This is a wonderful resource for learning grammar and it's absolutely for free. Then the next web service is Quizzes. I have already mentioned that I use it while practicing uh, speaking, um, but um, I have some more favorite options here, um, and one of them is Teleport, another one is Lesson Plan. It was um, newly added uh, to quizzes. Um, you can add suitable questions from available tests, which significantly spares your time. You can integrate multimedia and tests in your lesson plan. Set time limits for each question or and have a competition online in a class or assign it as a home as homework. And monitor the results, get feedback and identify weak points. So here on the slides you can see where you can find this teleport function and here is the screenshot of my page, my web page in quizzes and here you can either start a life lesson and assign homework. This is for a lesson plan. So what about developing writing skill? As we know, writing has always seemed quite a dull task to do. Even the best students in my group struggle to write longer pieces. Moreover, in my time, in the times of distance learning, it is almost impossible to monitor the uncontrollable desire of students to use Google Translate. 
I would like to share one idea which is not particularly mine, but I once liked it very much and occasionally use it to motivate my teenagers to write. If you ask teenagers what they would like to be in the future, at least one person in the group will tell you that they want to be a blogger. That is why when they have found out they will have to write a blog entry and post it on Instagram. Even those who usually skip deadlines and avoid doing writing tasks appear to be excited. The task was to write about their hobbies and choose a suitable photo or picture to illustrate a story. I haven't really thought of it, but one of my students asked if he could post the video. I was like, sure, if you want to. And I was surprised when the other said that they wanted to video too. And then I got the idea. For teenagers, social nets are the place where they can show what they are good at. Add a good text in English and you will definitely be noticed and you will get lots of likes, reposts and followers. What is more, one can receive uh, feedback from their peers in the form of comments. Rarely have I received so many completed words before the end of the deadline. So here you can see the um, screenshots from the Instagram. Um, this is the blog entry about the hobby. One of my students, um, the one which is dancing here, you can see on the slide, uh, she shared um, her Instagram stories and her post where she was dancing. And she seemed to be very pleased because she was reposted. I intentionally don't dwell on listening since it's the only thing that can be done equally effective online and offline, hoping for the honesty of your students, of course. So, talking about some universal digital resources, I would also like to mention um, British Council, but everybody knows it, and uh, this uh, website, islcollective.com. Here you can see, um, you can find any kind of worksheets that will meet any requirements, and all these materials are represented for free. Now, I would like to say a couple of words about Google Classroom. Why I like it so much? There are several reasons why I use Google Classroom. The first one is simplicity. You can add the students to the course you have created by either sending them a link or giving a code of the course. Once setting up a course and adding your students, you can post the messages and create the tasks. My favorites are the functions to choose the students who will do the particular tasks. It works well when you have different variants of the test and you want to assign it to particular students and the option to uh, add the task to the timetable. You can set the date and the time when your task will be posted and the members of the course will receive the notification on their email. You can also set time limit for your Google Forms using an app form limiter. All these settings help to avoid cheating at the test. Firstly, students simply don't have time to help each other because time is limited and the form will no longer accept responses if they don't do it on time. Secondly, they can't see any other assigned works uh, except their own ones. What is also convenient, you will be instantly informed by email when somebody completes the work. Yes, right. So here on the slide, you can see um, how it works. So once again, um, add it to the timetable and here choose the particular um, members of the course and then they will receive the notification online. <clears throat> Finally, I would like to talk about giving personal feedback. It is especially important when you cannot work with your students face to face and uh, sometimes they hide behind the black squares in the Zoom conference with their microphone switched off. Some of them really have technical problems. Some of them simply cheat and you will never know about it. So it's sometimes almost impossible to define whether they understand what they are taught or not. Google Forms are good for giving personal feedback. When you check the results of a particular student and you want to point out the mistakes they have done they have made. You can write a personal comment right under the question where they, ha they have made a mistake. Then you publish the results they, um, and they receive them by email and they can read your notes and explanations. Kahoot and quizzes give the instant feedback. If the wrong option was chosen, the players see what the right one was.
Personal messages are more time consuming, but also more efficient. I send them by email and in WhatsApp, also using voice messages. At least it creates an illusion of something remotely resembling normal communication. I hope that some of this information was um, interesting for you and you can apply it in your own work. Tatiana, your microphone is off. Okay, thank you, Ala. The presentation was great. And um, a lot of uh, teachers uh, face the question, oh my God, where should I find the tool for assessing? Uh, how to choose the tool for uh, giving students uh, constructive um, feedback? And now, Aigul Kusainava is an expert in these questions. Get ready to meet her. Aigul Kusainova is an English teacher from uh, Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools in Petropavlovsk. Okay, so good afternoon, dear colleague. I hope you hear me. Do you hear me? Yes, okay. And I hope you see my presentation. Okay, good. So first of all, yes, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Aigul. Uh, it is my seventh year of uh, working as an English teacher and last five years I'm working in NIS and um, let's uh, start with the main part of my live presentation. So uh, if we talk about online teaching uh, this year it goes without saying that um, we have to make a rapid transition uh, so from traditional tra traditional face to face to online learning, and we as educators uh, reconsidered uh, teaching and learning process uh, in order to provide quality education despite the circumstances. Additionally, from teachers, uh, it required to have uh, some skills, knowledge, uh, I would say even competence to. Um, to make lessons effective, uh, to help children uh, acquire knowledge, also to encourage students to participate actively in the lessons and also raise uh, academic performance of our learners. Another important thing that is worth mentioning is uh, the need to uh, assess learners' uh, works and provide constructive feedback in remote learning. So uh, that is why I would like to focus on assessment in teaching English. In particular, I would like to focus on tools as from my personal experience, I found very effective um, that helped me to assess students' achievements in uh, distance learning. So uh, most of you already aware uh, about Kahoot and Quizlet. So these are apps that we usually use in order to assess uh, students' vocabulary comprehension and also practice. Uh, for more serious reasons, uh, such as uh, summative assessment for term, summative assessment for unit, uh, we use Google Forms that help us test students' listening and reading comprehension. Recently, we have discovered uh, such tool as WordBall. So they make our lessons more entertaining because it con contains different themes, colors. You may uh, employ different types of tasks. Uh, thanks to my colleague, Dostan Sekenovich, we started using Neopod and it all really made our lessons more interactive, more engaging. And in my presentation today, I would like to focus on Flipgrid. So uh, someone uh, previously mentioned about it. And 
uh, during this presentation, you will be aware about Flipgrid as an effective tool to assess learner speaking skills. Also, we will look at the way how to assign the task using Flipgrid, how to create an assessment rubric according to the needs and requirements, and provide constructive feedback. Also, if uh, I have time, I hope I will uh, uh, show some examples that we did with students and submitted their works. So this is how the site looks like, Flipgrid. Uh, when you start using it first time, of course, you need to sign up. So you may see at the top in the right corner, educate or sign up. You will need to indicate your name, your last name, email, uh, some details about uh, subject you teach, uh, school you work in like middle school, primary school, or high school, but as I am um, already signed up, I will just log in. So could you please give me just a second? I would like to share my screen. Okay, please could you let me know if you see the screen? Yes, it's in. Okay, good. So, thank you. So, as you see, uh, I uh, already use it. That's why I just logged in. And here we have discussion, discovery, activity, mix, tape, shorts, and grid polls. So, uh, discussion, yes. This is like the main part of Libgrid, where you create groups, topics. Discovery, uh, here in discovery, you may find uh, the, um, yeah, some let's say topics that were already created by other users of Flipgrid and who already shared with the whole world. Activity here, you may see uh, the last um, actions, the last activities you did with your students. Mixtape here, you may combine several topics and create one video and share with students. Shorts, uh, like the, uh, so uh, also you may record video, capture your screen and share with uh, ideas at any time. And grid polls, you decide if uh, access will be and your profile available to others, then you click on active. So educators can connect with me or hidden. So educators cannot view my profile. So I suggest uh, moving to discussion and uh, here we see, uh, I will show you step-by-step -step guidance how to create uh, the group, the topic. So I already have some groups, but let's not uh, pay attention to that. Uh, so here we have, I can create a group. So we click on it. Uh, we can do it private or public. I prefer private and I create a group name, let it be, for example, grade 11 uh, C, okay? So uh, here I choose um, how students will have access to this group. Either they will use the student email or student uh, username. Uh, honestly saying I prefer students email because it helps to organize the topics within this group and it is more convenient to work in, uh, in it. So we click next. Uh, next step, we need to, as I have chosen emails of students, here I need to indicate uh, emails domains uh, that will have access to this uh, topic. That is why I add that. Uh, then uh, most of students, they use uh, gmail.com. So I may mention gmail, just domain, okay, gmail.com then press on enter. Also in our school, uh, both teachers and learners, uh, we have one school, uh, let's say cooperative email, and its domain is ptr.nas.edu.kz. So I add this. Maybe some students use um, mail.ru. You may add also mail.ru and, and others uh, domains that your students uh, use. And we click next. Uh, so we can uh, duplicate the topics. For example, I have four groups already, and we have the topic speaking practice IELTS part two. You may duplicate it if you want to have the same topic in this group, or you can just skip it for now. Here we see the code. 
and let's go to the group that we have created. So here we have the group, grade 11C. As we can see, there are no responses still, no views, no comments. Here we have the code, just a kind of picture. You may replace it, it's up to you. And now we need to create the first topic in this group. So we have topics, we have students, and uh, we click on icon add a topic. Uh, here we need to add a title. Okay, let's let it be, for example, conference, um, conference ends of October. Yeah, let it be like that. Then uh, in prompt box, you need to add the questions or maybe instructions for your students what they should do. Uh, and uh, here we have some features. If you want to emphasize some uh, texts, you may uh, click on bold, italics, underline. Also, you can click uh, the link. Yeah. Uh, maybe one of the activities can be to listen to the video on YouTube or whatever, any other uh, sites. So you, you need to follow this uh, site. Uh, copy the link, then click on this icon, yeah? and you need to, to copy and paste this link here and insert it. Okay, let it be, for example, listen to speakers and uh, leave um, your feedback. Let it be like a task. And then here you may um, maybe indicate some questions that your students should to include in your speech. Also, it is very uh, good uh, option here that you may regulate the time, the recording time uh, for speech of your students. Uh, for example, uh, let's say that according to exam guidelines, students should speak for about two minutes. Okay, then I said timing, let it be two minutes, and it means that student speech will be recorded within a certain period of time. In this situation, it will be two minutes, that's all. And if uh, you are satisfied with what you have, you may create the topic. But Flipgrid has other features, some additional options that you can use by clicking on icon more options. So let's click on it. So as you can see, you may add some links uh, to this task. Also, it shows you the topic status. So either the topic will be active, frozen, or hidden. Uh, also, it is convenient here that you have scheduled dates. It means uh, that you may uh, choose when the task uh, will be available to students. For example, let it be 10th October. And when, for example, you want uh, to close an access to this task. For example, let it be 17th or 18th of October. So it means that within this period, students can submit their speaking on the given topic. So you can schedule it. Next topics features. Um, as you can see, it includes notifications, topic followers, and download and share. So uh, as students uh, log in with the help of their emails, they will get daily, weekly, uh, or no notifications in the emails, or they will get notification when every new video or comment will uh, be submitted uh, here. Next, a video features. So uh, as it was said, I guess, previously here students record their videos. So they turn on the camera uh, and there are several options, selfies and videos, just selfies and videos. Of course, we prefer videos only because, or videos and selfies, because we can watch uh, like, how the person, how the student is speaking, looking in the screen, not reading. Yeah. Also, we can decide if students can uh, delete, rearrange, or edit the video, if the students can attach the link to the video. Usually, I don't choose this option. Uh, just for entertainment, you can uh, click on 
uh, here and let your students uh, like each other's videos. Also, it shows how many views it has and allows sticky notes. And now let's quickly move to feedback. So there are two options as you can see, basic feedback and custom feedback. So basic feedback, it includes just ideas and performance. The custom feedback, it is uh, here you may provide like um, criteria that um, respond to your requirements. For example, usually we have fluency, coherence, grammatical range, accuracy, lexical resource, and pronunciation. Let me show how to do that quickly. So we add on the icon add criteria, and here we need to uh, like uh, write a title. Let it be content, maybe. Uh, Next box, you need to provide a description, yeah, that uh, students should produce full um, sentences in their speech, uh, maybe answer all the questions in the tasks, and maybe, and so on. And you decide what is minimum score, maybe zero, maybe one, and what is maximum score. For example, we usually uh, can give six points as a maximum and you create and you will see that you have this criteria added you may delete what is not necessary for you yeah by clicking on delete and we click on create the topic so i have yeah as you can see the topic is ready so you see the link you copy this link and then you share if you work in zoom or if you work in teams you share this link with your students students follow this link and they have access to this uh, topic also another option you may just click on share and again you can copy link from here and share with your students Okay, uh, let me show you some examples that we did with my students just quickly. As you can see, for example, I have already groups. I have grade 11E. Here we practiced IELTS exam because this year they're going to have this exam. And there was topic speaking practice IELTS part two. Uh, you see the task, present your speech on the given cue card, use one of the strategies, duration two minutes. So uh, quick instructions. Each student had a certain cue card. And you see there are three responses. And uh, you see, if you click on it, you will see your student's video. And below, if you scroll down, you see details, feedback, and edit. So in details, you may record your feedback if you don't want to type, and it will be public. If you want to provide more private feedback, you may click on here, feedback. As you can see, there are criteria. I have already created, according to them, the her speech will be assessed. And I have provided a short feedback in this box. Then I emailed to her. So she got this feedback on email that she used uh, when she logged in. So I guess uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope you found this presentation uh, useful and I wish you good luck in your teaching and learning. Thank you very much, I go. Now uh, it's time to introduce Yelena Kikolo, is a Nazarbayev intellectual school teacher. She is a, uh, an expert in the field of assessment. Please, dear colleagues, get ready for your questions, be active, and use our chat room for writing your answers. We will be your voice for you, Elena. Okay, great, let's start. Elena Kiko. Yelena? Uh, switch on your microphone.
Helena, Helena we can hear. It's okay. Yeah. Yes. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, and um, my name is Yelena. Okay. And uh, I'm a teacher of Nazarbayev Intellectual School and also a coordinator of uh, teachers' professional development in our department. And so today uh, I would like to present uh, my session and it will be dedicated to lesson objective for successful assessment. And so uh, my uh, session is going to be to consist of three parts. It's interactive activity, as Tatiana have mentioned, uh, theoretical issues. So I just call it theoretical issues, but actually I just would like to share my experience of how I state their uh, lesson objectives and the practical part, but it's optional. Uh, if we have time, we will do this. If not, so uh, unfortunately, no, because we have just only 15 minutes uh, for the session. And so to start with, I would like to um, remind that uh, talking about the lesson objective, we have to keep in mind that it should be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And so first I would like, now I would like you to have a rest. So, and just play together. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you a task and you please try to uh, find out, e is it for finding the specific information, main idea or deduce meaning? So uh, I know that some teachers, um, it's a bit tricky for some teachers to identify what activity to choose to cover the objectives about specific main idea or deduce meaning. And so the first task is scan the article as quickly as you can and tick the information that is mentioned. Do not read it carefully word by word. So what I'm saying, is it about main points, specific information or deduce meaning? You may write in a chat and Tatiana will in announce your answer. What are you saying? What activity is suitable for? Okay, Tatiana? Maybe specific information. <laughs> right, okay, of course, specific information because students have to quickly find the information which is stated in the task. Well done. So, next one. Well, write one word in the middle of each article. Uh, sorry, so called. Uh, so students look at the pictures and try uh, one word here, so, and here also, what kind of um, objective it may be for uh, identifying main points, specific information, or deduce meaning. Some teachers answer uh, main points and some of them deduce meaning. <laughs> uh, so, yes, it, it may be, uh, this one may be for deduce and meaning, but mostly it's for main points or main idea because you summarize what you see here. This is like punctuation marks and this is like for holidays or something like this. Okay, so thank you very much. I have some more uh, tasks for you for today. So the next one, underline the word or phrase in each sentence, which can be replaced by the word, uh, word in bold. Mm -hmm. Maybe what? Deduce meaning, of course. When we work with the vocabulary, we will want, when we want our students to um, uh, find the meaning uh, from the text or different kinds of exercises which connect it with the meaning of the uh, words, like with the vocabulary, it's always deduce meaning. Okay, well done. And next. So the next task, just imagine that here is the text, okay? And the task is read the articles and give the title to each of the articles. Is it main point, specific information, or deduce many? So just imagine that there are several texts, uh, texts or articles. Teachers point number one. And I have uh, to say that uh, they previously uh, answered correctly. Okay, yes. Main points or idea, of course, because students have to read the text and just summarize the main idea. And so uh, here on my slide, you see that uh, this lesson objectives, which uh, comes from uh, lesson objective, which comes from seventh grade till the 11th. So it's in secondary school and in um, Nazarbayev intellectual school, even in 12th graders. Well done. The next, uh, read, listen uh, to the text and say. So this may be, uh, this task may be used for listening or for reading, it doesn't matter. And so maybe you create such questions like, what does the writer want you to know? What is the author uh, teaching me about the topic and state the general statement that could sum up the story? Is it for about main ideas or uh, specific information information or did use a meaning? The, popu uh, the most popular answer is number two. 
right it's main points or implied meaning so we have in seven grades we have such objective which uh, says like students can uh, find or identify the implied meaning so implied meaning just the same as main points but the main idea is not stated directly students have to just understand the text and they it's like for deep reading and mostly it's connected with the concepts of literature okay and so yes you see even in seven graders understand with little support some of the implied meaning and many teachers when they come to the seminars they ask what it means implied implied meaning so implied meaning it's easy it's main points but not directly state okay thank you and the last one uh, the last task for you is um, next uh, read the text and guess the meaning of the words in the box so again main points specific information or deduce meaning it's easy did you of course, deduce, deduce meaning. Number yes. three, yes. Deduce meaning, yes. Okay, good. And so we come to the second part of my session. And so now I'm going just to share how I state the learning objective for the lesson. So, uh, sorry, from learning objective to lesson objectives. And so in our plans, we have the section which it says students will be able to. And just to be successful with this, we have to think about uh, it deeply. And so, for example, I would like my students to. Um, to be ready to find specific information and I want them to cover this um, objective, it's according to my plan. And so uh, I choose their task, like listen to the uh, experts and match them with the given sentences. So I will take two objectives for this lesson, like understand with little support, more specific information and recognize the opinion of the speakers. So next. First, I, I should think, how can my students achieve this objective? Why, what, what activity should I uh, choose for them? And so, of course, if it is listening, they will have to be able to find or hear the keywords, phrases, they have to identify the mood of the speakers and so on. So here, of course, I want my students to understand uh, the, uh, what the speaker says, okay? And I have two options for a lesson objective, like students will be able to understand the key phrases in the listening task. How, what are you saying? Is it possible to write uh, such, um, such form of uh, such lesson objective in our plan? No, because understand it's not measurable. So how you can measure? Well, and it's better to, uh, to like formulate this, like identify specific details through the keywords and so on. Okay, so then, and of course, the second one will be more, uh, more correct in this case. Next, and the next words recognize the opinion of the speakers in supported extended talk. And so, of course, what I will teach my students. Uh, sorry, I need, uh, well, what do I teach my students? So, of course, differentiate facts from opinions, and maybe I will show some examples of facts and opinions. And so, again, which is correct, uh, understand what the speakers mean. Yes, I want my students to understand, but it's not measurable again. And so, I will state, like, identify the attitude of a speaker towards the topic of the talk. So, it will be uh, um, more correct as, as I think. Okay, and next it's uh, a bit more in detail. So the next uh, object I take is ask complex questions. First, just I should think uh, how my students can achieve this objective and what should I teach. So uh, I plan this. How, of course, I want my students know how to ask general, specific, or alternative and text questions. Okay, accurate what order in questions, what intonation to use. Okay, so then how can, why, what activities my students can achieve this? So maybe I will plan um, uh, that my students will make up questions to the text. Uh, maybe they can do mini survey interviews or dialogues, okay? So it's not in one lesson. Uh, I will take just one activity for the lesson just to cover these objectives. And so my students will be able to, it will depend, of course, on the lesson. Formulate closed and open questions. Maintain, maintain a dialogue by asking questions or conduct many scale survey questionnaires and interviews. So, of course, not. It's not. Uh, I won't use it in one lesson because it's too much. But it will depend on the topic and it will depend uh, on activities which uh, you uh, will choose. And so, it's easy for me, like, uh, to uh, create the assessment criteria. So. 
ask question, uh, students will be successful with the achieving of the objective if my students ask questions following the correct word order. And so they will uh, make no more than two mistakes. Okay, so the next one is, uh, the next objective uh, which I take is um, make hypotheses and evaluate. So also I should think what should I teach. So of course discussing different points of view or uh, revise if clause, how to find or give strong arguments to prove students' opinion. And of course I will teach them useful language, uh, just how to express their opinion. And so I think uh, how can students achieve the objective? So by finding solutions to the given problems, they can do many research and present it, then give feedback to peers. And so my students will be able to, again, it's not in one lesson, it's just uh, depend on, on the topic. And so if I ask them to give solution, to find solution, so my students will be able to generate ways to find solution to a wide range of issues or discuss, debate on a local topics and uh, or um, through independent research project, present finding based on ind independent research or provide constructive feedback on others. On others. So, and of course, I will. I may take this objective. Uh, I may use this objective in a, a series of lessons, not in one lesson only. So, in the assessment criteria, suggest at least one idea, okay, or give reasonable feedback to peers, okay. And one more, uh, I would like if I want my teachers to write a, a letter to a friend. So the reason uh, objective like plan, write, edit and proofread work. So in the lessons, what uh, I will teach my students, of course, brainstorming ideas, key features of basic uh, written genres, paragraph and text structures, basic linking words, and even strategies to proofread and edit writing for spelling and pronunciation. So uh, my students will be able to create a logical structured letter to a friend to tell him about his trip or check their own and others' letters to ensure that it communicates with what they intended to say. Okay, and so the assessment criteria arrange the writing in paragraphs and use linking words, for example. Okay, and one more and the last one for today is like write with some support about personal feelings and opinions. Okay, and so of course I, I plan to use this um, objective for some lessons, not only in one. And so in, I should think what my teacher, my, what my students uh, will, what I will teach my students in the lesson. Uh, of course, differentiate between effect and opinion. Okay, using opinion phrases, how to state the opinion, describing feelings, and using adjectives. I will revise adjectives uh, if it is uh, the seven graders, and so planning and organizing sorts in a logical sequence. And so uh, I don't write this anyway. It's just for me, it's my planning. What I'm going to teach, just to cover this objective. And so uh, then. Uh, my students, in the, by the end of the lesson, uh, will be able to express their opinion okay, in a letter providing arguments and evidence. And the assessment criteria will be just arrange the ideas in a letter format, use of opinion phrases and use of adjectives. For me, it's enough if they use at least three, four adjectives at, uh, in their writing. Okay, so uh, here I come to the uh, to the last minute, and so this was uh, our last objective. It's like the samples, and I, I wanted just to share my experience how I do this, and I hope that this will be useful for the other teachers. Okay, and so I want to finish uh, with the words uh, like making a lesson plan is easy when you know how to do this, and creating effective lesson plans is the key to effective teaching and a critical factor in achieving positive students outcome. So dear participant, thank you very much for your attention and for your patience and for your active participation in the discussion when we work on the first part of my session. Thank you very much. Great, Elena, great, thank you. And now I would like to introduce a really global citizen and professional with such an amazing working experience in so many countries. Oxford University Press Regional Training Coordinator for Central Asia, Middle East and North Africa, Paul Woodfall. There should be applause. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, there we go. Are we ready?
Can you see my screen? I, can you hear me, first of all? Can you see my screen? I am amazed at your, uh, your lovely introduction. And I'm just trying to get the chat box up so I can uh, start my session. But it's sticking. So you can hear me. Very good. Thank you very much. OK. Um, I am having a little technical difficulty. So I'm going to keep it on auto hide. There we are. That's better. Now I can see what I'm doing. So let's begin. Um, and I've lost the chat box again. This is very embarrassing. There we go. Welcome to Zoom. So let's begin. Um, thank you to Atenk. Thank you for the introduction. I've, I've already written thank you to Dina for moderating in the previous sessions and what a wonderful uh, lots of sessions we've had. The quality has amazed me. Um, I really, today we're looking at global skills and um, I would like to uh, begin with a little task. It's a very simple task and I need my chat box there to help me. In the chat box, everybody, I'd like you to type a color into the, into the chat box. Yeah, just the first color that comes to your head Let's see what we've got. Thank you. We've got green, we've got red, blue, green, black. That's interesting. Green, red, blue, dark blue, purple. Yes. Uh huh. White, black, orange. Yes. Yeah, interesting. Great. While we're looking at the carry on, carry on typing, there's 140 people. Carry on typing. If you've typed in your color, have a look at the word cloud and tell me what you think. Uh, you understand from the word cloud. I specifically would like you to look for um, any uh, acronyms you can see in the word cloud, any acronyms of international associations or organizations. Purple seems to be a favorite. Um, monitoring the chat box, Dina, uh, could you just uh, scroll up and down for me and have a look to see what the most popular color is? We've got lots of greens and blues, um, lots, of, um, lots of purple too, interesting. Um, and as I said, what I'm waiting for more, you can put in your colors, UNESCO pops up, right, thank you, UNESCO, you can see UNESCO. Any other global organizations can you see in that uh, word cloud, which comes from wordclouds.com, it's a wonderful uh, word cloud creator. Um, OECD, thank you very much, Osana, Oksana, OECD. So we've got um, August as well, OECD. We've got UNESCO. Can we see any more? Let's have a look. Well, keep those colors in mind. Uh, PISA, thank you. Yes, Richard, PISA, he spotted PISA. And so did a couple of others. Right, PISA. Um, so basically, global skills is a global concern. Um, there are lots of international frameworks on global skills. We have UNESCO, we have um, PISA, UNESCO's, oops, UNESCO's uh, Four Pillars of Education is a publication that you can read, OECD on PISA, Global Competence Framework, um, the Association of Teaching um, Assessment and Teaching of 21st Century Skills based in Melbourne. Nobody spotted that, maybe that's a little bit more, uh, um, uh, unique um, and the uh, that's both based in Melbourne in Australia and uh, of course we have the framework for 21st century learning which used to be called the partnership for 21st century learning all of these have been consulted all of these organizations and OUP Oxford University Press has created a global skills position paper which summarizes all that information and you will be able to read through the uh, position paper at the end of this um, presentation. Um, the position paper has the following uh, lovely little caricatures of each of the global skills. There are five, as you can see, five uh, clusters and each individual cluster represents something. 
Now, if you were blue, I'd like you to look at your picture and think, what does that mean? And in the chat box, put in what you think that represents. If you, were, you chose purple as your color, what does that represent? Red, what does that represent for you, red? And of course, if you typed in green in the chat box, what does that represent? You have a picture of a laptop and a mobile device. For any other colors, if you chose, and lots of you chose black or white or dark blue, um, look at number four and think, what does that represent for you? So starting with blue, we've got cooperation, collaboration, uh, blue problem solving, Hamdi Hussain, uh, problem solving. I'm not sure if that's problem solving. Um, red is caring, yes, underneath the umbrella. Red is caring. Four is for feelings. Okay. Do we have any other ideas? Red, Gulnara thinks support. Red is being friendly, okay. Green is communication, uh, any more specifically about green there? Okay, purple, ideas, all right. Um, I refer back to Richard's session earlier on this morning uh, and what was, what was Richard talking about? Yes, Katerina says critical thinking, um, exactly. Uh, that's the answer to uh, purple. Um, green interactive communication. I refer you back to um, Dastan Ala uh, Aigul and Yelen. No, Dastan Ala and Aigul's presentations. What uh, what were they looking at specifically? Dastan Ala and Aigul. Um, they were looking at technology. Blue is for team working, right? Green is for technology. Uh huh. ICT. Yep, okay. What about number four? Do we have any more ideas? All the other colors that you chose, black, um, white, other, other options there for number four. These are all the global skills. Uh, diversity, Tatiana, you're looking at number four. You're talking about diversity? Or is it the red group you were considering? Uh, number four, you We've got collaboration, uh, teamwork for number four. Collaboration. Uh, oh, there's some difference in opinion between Zikrina and Ainagul. Ainagul says emotion. Uh, Richard Harrison chose Burgundy. That's a, that's, that goes with your character, Richard. That's um, a very strong color. Luxury. <laughs> um, okay, number four, perspective, different points of view all the mentioned skills that we've had before. Look at the man holding the balloons. What, are, what can you see on the balloons? And there's a balloon that's flying away with a sad face. What, uh, what would that represent, I wonder? Well, to put you out of your misery, um, looking at the green, looking at the green, we have um, digital literacies, and as I said, that was um, that was brought up very well in those previous sessions. Um, I loved Allah's very short uh, video that she made, uh, going through the whole spectrum of options on digital resources. Um, I and um, I ghoul as well, looking at uh, the problems with connectivity with rural areas. There were lots of really nice, um, nice ideas in there. And um, if you chose green, it's actually digital literacies, which is uh, one of the key aspects of global skills, as we found today uh, in this first session of um, Atenk's um, first virtual session, uh, which to, you know, has been amazing for me. I'm, I'm completely um, knocked back by the quality of the presentations and how wonderfully skillful they were um, put into practice, unlike mine, where I had a few hiccups to begin with. Um, 
these are specialized skills for learners to acquire. And as you can see, I've been doing digital classes for a, about eight months now, and I still find that uh, I have a few little problems and hiccups when presenting. Um, they should be integrated regularly with the other global skills that we have been looking at, the blue, the purple, the red, um, and the other colors. Um, therefore, really synchronous and asynchronous learning, and I think that's very important uh, that we bear that in mind. Why are they literacies? Um, social media was brought up, I think, by, um, by Ala in her section, looking at uh, using Instagram, using um, um, social media. I think it was Ala who mentioned that. Um, Teenagers love social media, so use it for, use it for their, um, their tasks and you'll get them engaged a lot easier. Um, so literacies are basically, you know, it can be on a laptop, it can be on a mobile and we need to incorporate both. The questions we ask about uh, digital literacies in the classroom are thinking about options, thinking about using social media especially with teenagers, um, thinking about responsibility for their uh, own learning. Um, uh, that's a really important area. With asynchronous tasks, uh, again, WhatsApp was mentioned. Um, WhatsApp as a discussion chat is a very useful tool, especially in rural areas where connectivity is a problem. Uh, most people will have WhatsApp to be able to connect to or Telegram, depending. And I think um, that the use of WhatsApp for follow-up tasks while students are busy working on, on an assignment is really, really useful. Um, are they aware of the skills they need to do the task? And this is where collaboration comes in, the, uh, the ability to discuss with others. Uh, Google Docs, Google Forms were mentioned earlier on. Um, are they aware of what's appropriate for an essay or a discussion chat? So when we're looking at students, we need to make sure they're aware of all of these different options. In, uh, for teachers, how do we operate the technology? We've seen lots of examples of apps that we can use. Um, I would just point out that, you know, keep it simple. Um, I find that using lots of different apps when you can use a chat box equally well, um, using lots of apps can be uh, quite dangerous and take it's very time consuming um, but there we have it you know we have lots of lovely examples of apps there that you obviously can operate and are using in your classes and integrating them with the course book that's that's the main thing uh, they have a course book at home and we are teaching to that course book our lesson objectives Yelena was talking about lesson objectives as well as overall aims and objectives integration and um, I, I'd say you know like today we are learning as Christopher started the sessions off he started off talking about how teachers can um, connect with other teachers and keep learning and and this is a marvelous forum in which to do that. So here we are, uh, back on global skills. Blue, uh, most of you guessed uh, something to do with, I think some, some of you said critical thinking, some of you said um, um, uh, collaborating. Uh, purple, most of you said thought, critical thinking. Red was the idea of emotions, I, I like that. Um, green, we've already been looking at, which was digital literacies, and of course, the other one for the all the other colors, um, that had a few different options. I'm now going to reveal what they are, and well done to those of you blues who said it was about communication or collaboration. Um, remember, 21st century skills. Communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. Those are the, the prime areas that we have been looking at during the sessions this morning. Um, they are 21st century skills. And the other three areas of global skills are actually, uh, the red was intercultural competence and citizenship. We'll be having a quick look at those in a moment as well as uh, all the other colors. Number five was emotional, or was it number four? Sorry, number four, emotional self-regulation and well-being. 
which is an area when we're dealing with digital uh, classes, when we're dealing with uh, distance learning, it's an area we really have to monitor very carefully. Uh, we can see a student in the classroom, we can talk to an individual student if we see, um, perceive that the student has some kind of problem today, uh, is angry, is unhappy. Um, you know, we can perceive that, but it's more difficult when we're doing online classes. So the idea there is to make sure that when we're online, we think about emotional self-regulation and well-being. And as teachers as well, we can burn ourselves out very quickly um, when we're teaching online, as you have probably experienced. So, um, communication and collaboration, we do this all the time when we're asking uh, students to work in groups uh, to do a task with your partner decide on something uh, how do we do it more innovatively breakout rooms on zoom was mentioned that is a very useful tool in short sessions where we can monitor discussion um, how do we do this we can also do this in a simpler manner we can do this with whatsapp discussion chats um, we can monitor it because we're in the chat so we can see what students are doing and they can post voice messages and they can do short presentations of what they uh, of the task that they've been doing and that is a way of making sure that there is communication and collaboration going on in the um, digital sphere Creativity and critical thinking. If I ask you to read, uh, read the uh, instructions on the slide there, you can see um, if I were to ask you to go away and come back half an hour later with a piece of paper and draw the logo from memory, um, would you be able to do it? I think actually it's a very, it's a very nice image. Um, and um, as you can see, it's a light bulb with, uh, underneath the light bulb we have eureka we have that moment when a student's understood a new concept evaluated some information and created something new we have the two hemispheres of the brain um, so i'm explaining the design for you uh, we have them in different colors as well to make it more attractive i think the design is very effective i don't know if anybody agrees with me but in the chat box do you agree yes or no is that a uh, you know an effective design for critical thinking in the chat box yes or no waiting for messages now as we're waiting for yeses or no's but what do you notice about these prompts Ainur says yes 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 we've got Katerina Tamara Larissa they're all saying yes yeah I think it's a lovely it's a lovely uh, logo it's very memorable and I think if we present that to students as well um, It'll, it'll make them, you know, we can discuss that simple logo and talk about what is creativity, what is critical thinking. Richard was talking about it, you know, thinking in general is something we do every day, but, uh, you know, creative thinking is very specific. Critical thinking is also very, very specific. Um, not really they should be doing group brainstorming first, says Galina. Well, um, uh, I'm just looking at the logo and asking questions about the logo. We're, we haven't actually got a task in, in hand. Um, the prompts, Galina, uh, thank you for your comment. I agree, brainstorming is important. Uh, what do you notice about these prompts? Well, the prompts are there to, to actually encourage critical thinking. Because of the time, I've talked you through them. But if we had more time for this session, uh, I would go through those prompts without showing you the actual picture and uh, the logo and see what would happen as you were um, recreating the logo and thinking about it. Uh, so the prompts there actually are the kind of probing questions that we need for critical thinking. Um, moving on to cultural competence, intercultural competence and citizenship. Um, this is very important in a global world, um, becoming aware of different perspectives. I was in, for example, I was in Karaganda in February. And um, for me, uh, in uh, February in Karaganda, you know, for somebody to say to me, the weather's better today, 
was an understatement. I can see you're smiling there. Um, it was an understatement because, you know, they were, they were uh, saying, you know, yesterday it was raining and it was cold, but it was, you know, overcast. And today there's the sun. And uh, I, I kind of thought, you know, the worst I've ever been in for me um, in my life was minus 20. You know, that, that's the worst, you know, the worst kind of cold I've ever experienced. Uh, the temperature was minus 30 something, 34, I think, at four o'clock in the morning, waiting at the railway station in Karaganda, minus 34. And honestly, it was like, whoa, you know, I don't need coffee to wake up. I, you know, just walk out the door of your hotel. Woof. So perspectives, you know, the weather's better today. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, that's um, a very simple idea. If we think of umbrellas, of course, which is again, the image Yes, indeed, Dinara, it is a lamp that you can switch on and we can switch it on by promoting questioning. Uh, I noticed in the chat earlier on, we had somebody asking about uh, um, critical thinking and saying, yes, we need to promote asking questions with our, our classes and students are, are very, very shy when it comes to asking questions. I think we can do sessions simply on, you know, here's the statement, how many questions can you ask on this statement? Um, getting them used to questioning. Um, umbrellas, again, umbrellas, you know, culturally, um, umbrellas are used in countries for either uh, keeping the rain off or the snow or shading from the sun. Uh, they have different uses. Uh, in some countries, you store them outside the, the, main, the main entrance to the house. I believe in Japan, you take them inside. You, uh, you have a special umbrella stand inside the uh, house where you put them. Um, so cultural, uh, intercultural competence and citizenship is really uh, looking at aspects, especially in the course book when we're comparing Kazakhstan with the uh, other parts of the world, what people do, what beliefs they hold. Um, and if we're promoting uh, with our students the sense of belonging to a global uh, uh, identity then we really want to get them on board with how things are in countries they've never they've never visited and there are on 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 the internet you can find uh, virtual classrooms for geography um, Edmoda does it and others where you can actually watch videos of children doing a, a discussion of their local neighborhood um, it's fascinating um, to see that um, so that's intercultural competence. Uh, the last one that we haven't discussed is emotional self-regulation and well-being. In the classroom, as I said, we cannot, we can see our, our uh, students when we're online, we can't. But we do want to promote uh, both physical, mental, as well as social, physical and mental well-being. Um, and we want to ask our students to make sure. For example, uh, a lot of you like me have been here since about the start of the conference. Um, what should we do for our well-being uh, when the conference ends? Well, my advice was if it's, not, if, if it's not raining outside, of course, even if it is, go for a walk, go out into the country, do something else, leave a computer screen. You can, you can check the website later on. On Monday, um, our tank will have uploaded all the presentations and you can go back to it and have a look in your, in your free time and enjoy, enjoy your, uh, the experience. But after the conference ends, don't stay on the laptop. Do something else. Do some exercise. Make sure your kids are doing exercise as well. Um, make sure you ask people how they're feeling this morning if you're giving a class. Uh, just a quick five minutes, you know. How, who's, feeling, who's feeling bad? It's okay to feel bad. What's the problem? Do you want to share it? If you don't, I'm available for you offline. Or uh, if you want to share it, then let's discuss it. And we're a bit of critical thinking there to help out our, our classmates. Um, a global skills learning environment uh, has these components in, uh, in the mix. Um, the teacher's skills, especially with digital resources, uh, knowledge of subject matter and the world, and the teacher's attitude are key uh, to successful teaching. Um, and uh, success successful teaching online, of course, is similar. Uh, there's no real difference. Um, 
The students, we want them to collaborate, to communicate, we want them to critically think, we want them to think about intercultural competences and to have the idea that, you know, self-regulation, if I'm angry, then why am I angry? And think about, you know, how they can change their, their mood um, and discuss that freely. I think uh, that's one area with teenagers that is so important. Teenagers, as you know, are going through hormonal changes and they, they're not sure. They're not kids, they're not adults. They're not sure who they are. So emotional uh, self-regulation and well-being is key uh, in any of the tasks we deliver. Try and bring in those global skills. Um, we can assess global skills um, and the way of assessing them is pretty, pretty simple. In the position paper that I'm going to give you a reference to in a couple of minutes when we finish, in the position paper, um, you will find that um, you have rubrics to be able to, um, to uh, assess. And the kind of assessment we're looking at is qualitative. It's not about grades. It's uh, formative as well, giving us feedback as teachers. It's ongoing, it's manageable. It's a three point scale between those who are working towards, those who've achieved and those who've exceeded expectations. Um, and the rubrics that I mentioned, here's an example for emotional self-regulation and well-being. Uh, the rubrics are easy. They're already made for you. Uh, so you just need to kind of think about a scale you can give from one to five um, when we are looking at students' progress in emotional self-regulation and well-being. So recognizing, identifying, understanding mo emotions, selecting strategies for managing these emotions, awareness of general strategies to promote well-being and actions which contribute to a physically, mentally, and socially healthy lifestyle. Now, as I say, these rubrics and a lot more are found in the OUP position paper on global skills. If you have a QR code reader, then on your Android phone, then take a photo of the, uh, the QR code there. If you don't, then the website is very simple. It's Oxelt Global Skills. Uh, I'll just copy and paste that for you into the chat. And when you have gone there, you can then sign in and download the position paper. Um, it's very useful because there are uh, tips for classroom um, for actual lessons. Uh, there are useful, there's useful advice on managing each aspect of those global skills. So that's the position paper uh, from uh, OUP, Oxford University Press creating empowered 21st century citizens. We now have a little, we have about a minute. I'd like to take this uh, last minute to thank you for coming to the first virtual conference. Amazing, I'm gonna recommend Atenk to anyone and everyone I come across in my, in my uh, global uh, virtual travels. I, I, as I said, I was in Karaganda in February, that was almost before lockdown. I then went to Kuwait, came back and I couldn't travel anymore. So um, I'm looking forward to traveling again because I actually, you know, I like meeting people face to face, but it's good to meet you all, my face to yours. And I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you found it stimulating. Thank you again to Atenk and the um, partners, the sponsors who are up there at the top. My uh, email, paul.woodfall at oup.com. And um, I look forward to seeing you personally in the near future. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Paul. And I'm proud that you mentioned Kazakhstan is the country you know most amongst the countries around the world. I do. I do indeed. I have been to more cities and big towns in Kazakhstan than any other country. And I have traveled to about 80, uh, sorry, sorry, 80, 48, 48 different countries around the world, uh, including the UK, where I spent my secondary education. I know Kazakhstan above all, uh, beyond any other country. And it's fascinating. Fantastic. Um, Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, okay. Uh, now, 
I would like to uh, introduce um, the second representative of Oxford University Press, a business development manager for Central Asia, a sale by Batirava. Meet her, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you see me? Yes, I sell. Oh, excellent. Can you hear me? So, um, I'm really delighted uh, to be here today. And I would like to once again welcome you, dear teachers, dear colleagues, uh, to the first virtual attend conference. And um, I would like to extend uh, Oxford University Press gratitude to Albina Kasienova and Dina Alibekova for having invited, invited us to this wonderful uh, event and having organized this so perfectly well. And um, so my name is Asir Bogotirova um, and I represent Oxford University Press in Central Asia and I'm really delighted uh, to be talking to you today um, about Oxford Test of English. But uh, before proceeding right to my presentation on the Oxford Test, um, let's check if you've heard of Oxford Test of English, uh, what you know about Oxford Test, please type your um, ideas uh, in the chat box. If you haven't heard about it, no worries. Um, use your assumptions, your predictions, and nevertheless type your ideas about Oxford Test. Think about its format, um, what skills it tests, uh, what levels it reports at, um, just anything what uh, comes up to your mind when you think of Oxford Test of English. Please, you're welcome to type your ideas into the chat box. We're getting here different answers. Oh, great. Thank yeah. you for your participation, uh, for your active involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, Albina, can you please read out uh, the chat box uh, because uh, I can't see it, unfortunately. Uh, Tatiana? Oh, Tatiana, yes. Okay. Um, EDE Excel, it was for students, like checkpoint and IGCSE. Okay, mixture of IELTS and FCE. Uh, haven't heard tests for different levels, probably like IELTS. Skills mm -hmm. of levels. Oh, excellent. Um, now, let's watch a short video introduction on Oxford Test of English. Let's check your ideas. Let's see who is the closest uh, to the information on Oxford Test of English. Just let's watch a short video, very short video, which is less than one minute, and just check your ideas. Just a second. Still, there is no sound. Uh, it's it's uh, not that important. The okay. sounds are not important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see if we have a person who's got uh, the most uh, assumptions, the most uh, predictions correct. There was an answer from Saule, level of English A1, A2, B1, B2. Aha, uh -huh, excellent. Yes. 
Saulia, right? Yes. Okay, thank you, Saulia, uh, for your correct ideas on the Oxford test of English. So, uh, moving on further, uh, we will learn more about Oxford test of English. Uh, at the moment, you've got some basic ideas about Oxford test uh, from the video. Uh, we now know that it is two hours long, and as Saulia correctly uh, guessed, uh, probably you already, uh, it reports at three levels, at A2, B1, B2, and it tests all skills, and that is uh, listening, reading, speaking, writing. So how did Oxford University Press design Oxford Test of English? Um, we talked to different teachers, to different institutions, and um, different students, and this is what they told us. Students wanted a uh, test to be short and some tests you know they they could take hours and hours to complete and even uh, you had to do the speaking test on a different day uh, to the rest of the test teachers wanted uh, to be able to prepare their students for one test and with mixed ability classes test preparation might be a big problem institutions said uh, they wanted results they could trust and they told us that too often students with a certificate for a certain level didn't actually seem to be that level in one or more skills. Um, other students uh, wanted to take tests for skills they needed and some students only needed a test for one or two skills but found they had to take the test of all their skills which would cost them eventually more and take longer. And finally, students who needed to retake a particular skill didn't want to spend the time and money retaking the whole test, and which would require them to also seed all the other skills. So this is how we addressed uh, the students, teachers, and institutions' requirements and created Oxford Test of English. So it, is it was developed and validated by, by Oxford uh, University Press and independent experts. It is endorsed by the University of Oxford, university number one in the world. It is uh, the university takes up uh, the fifth time in a row, uh, the first place in an international university ranking. And it is aligned to common European framework. And apart from that, it is 100% online and you can do the test only in approved test centers, which requires minimum administration from approved test centers, and which, will, which would eventually save uh, teaching time. So teachers don't have to prepare the test, check the test, and just uh, think about the test at all. And Oxford Test of English uh, is developed for learners 16, uh, who are 16 years old. Apart from that, I would like to pay attention that uh, recently Oxford Test of English for Schools was developed and it is for pupils who are 12, from 12 till 16 years old. Um, one more important thing I would like to mention about Oxford Test, it is uh, computer adaptive, uh, adaptive nature. Please type your ideas, uh, what is meant by adaptive? We got here answers like Ekaterina thinks adaptive means for Kazakhstan, for example, like personalized. Mm. Let's see other ideas. Okay, okay. Thank you for your ideas. Yeah. Easy for different ages. Uh, Tatiana says for ESL learners. Mm -hmm. Renata says uh, simplified, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Olga says, uh, can be done on, com on a computer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These oh. answers we have. Okay, thank you so much for your ideas, dear teachers. So let's, uh, have, let's compare your ideas with um, the idea which I have on the slide, adaptive technology. So Oxford Test of English using adaptive technology. Uh, it, it means uh, that each uh, test taker has an individual experience because each uh, test is unique 
and adaptive nature uh, means that the test difficulty adapts to test takers ability and uh, quickly finding actually the right level for each test taker and which means that the questions are just at the right level of challenge uh, making the test more motivating more positive and shorter and less stressful than traditional proficiency test so oxford test of english uses adaptive technology this is what is meant by adaptive nature to sum it up um, oxford test of english is flexible test uh, so you can take all four modules at once, speaking, reading, listening, writing, or you can do one module at a time. You can take either speaking or writing, or you can, you can do a combination of modules. It is 100% online, and you can do it in an uh, approved test center. And it is also available 365 days a year. It is very flexible, test taker friendly test. It is internationally recognized at the moment in 23 countries by around 300 institutions. and. Uh, you can uh, have a look uh, at those institutions and countries on the website, which I'm going to give you a little bit later in a minute, because I don't press for time. And you can get results on listening and reading on the same day of the test, whereas uh, for speaking and writing modules, uh, since your responses are recorded online and automatically sent to certified and trained assessors, and you can get uh, uh, speaking, speaking and writing results uh, within 14 days of the test. And of course, you get your certificate of proficiency uh, if you take all four modules. Uh, and if you take just one module or two modules, you receive a module report card. So this is just a number of uh, countries, a small number of countries, uh, which recognize Oxford Test of English at the moment, 23 countries and around, as I said, 300 institutions all over the world in those uh, 23 countries. So if you have any other questions about Oxford Test of English, you are very welcome to contact me on my mobile or just uh, write me an email and I'll be more than delighted to answer about Oxford Test or just uh, use this uh, website, oxfordtestofenglish.com where you can find more detailed information about the test or you can do the uh, demo version of the test or you can just download uh, for free practice tests on Oxford Test of English. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please stay well and enjoy the weekend. Goodbye. Thank you, Estelle. Thank you. Thank you, you Estelle. Estelle. Special head. thank you, uh, Oxford University Press and Estelle and Camila and Interpress for receiving our invitation to present uh, on our conference. We are so pleased and so great, uh, grateful for your initiatives and uh, thank you for uh, presenting and sharing your resources. I think they're highly um, uh, needed right now in Kazakhstan and for English teachers. Thank you so much, Estiel, uh, bringing uh, international speakers to North Kazakhstan. And I think as we realized, our conference ended up being Kazakhstan and not only just North Kazakhstan, but national conference. Thank you so much for bringing uh, your experience, your uh, resources. I've seen here lots of comments from NIS teachers interested in your test here too. And I think other teachers will be interested also in your materials and resources. Okay, and now I would like to introduce Oksana Talaver, who will share her experience uh, of work and work with young learners. And I should say that everything starts in primary school, and we can regard it as a cradle where everything starts. Please, get ready for watching. Hello, dear audience. When I first started my career in the school system, I quickly realized that teaching young learners is indeed a uniquely different experience from teaching language to adults or even teenagers. One of the key features of a language learner is motivation. Motivation is thoughts and feelings which make us want to do and continue to want to do something and which turn our wishes into action. Motivation is in many cases a factor that helps to make uh, language learning successful. Here are some uh, features that influence motivation. In case of uh, young learners, they may not acquire some levels of personal motivation at once. Uh, 
At this point of their life, it may be just a class or a school subject that uh, their uh, parents insist on. Some learners may have strong personal motivation from the early age. Some may be unmotivated to learn at all. Motivating students in primary school is as fundamental as at any stage of their learning. Even more so, as in primary school, they acquire basic learning strategies. Encouragement and positive feedback are extremely important at that age. Building up confidence and learner autonomy will allow students to acquire the target language quicker and help them at the next step of their learning. Uh, I would like to share my experience and some tips for developing and sustaining motivation in young learners while teaching lang uh, English language. Uh, children, teenagers and adults have different levels of maturity, which heavily influences language learning. Young children often find it hard to sit still for longer periods of time and have a short attention span. Uh, to help them focus, we can use a variety of different means. First is the use of uh, a variety of energizers, which are a great way to recharge the atmosphere and energy in the classroom. For young learners, it is important to have even a little bit of movement during the lesson, and here energizers help not only to have a short break, but also ref um, refocus on the learning process. Energizers help with the development of language skills. For example, the energizer double this and double that helps to practice demonstrative pronouns. Energizers like we peel bananas is, uh, are a great way of uh, breaking monotonous activities uh, or wake up students early in the morning. Energizers facilitate positive and relaxed atmosphere for further learning. Young children learn through experience and doing. Active learning can be achieved through the use of songs and games. The young learners uh, generally respond very enthusiastically to songs in the classroom. Songs also provide a great authentic material for young learners. Ones based on TPR, like head, shoulders, knees and toes, serve not only like a fun activity, but also as a way of practicing vocabulary. Uh, there are um, lots of digital resources. The one that I like are on the screen. Uh, also, primary uh, music box is an extremely good addition with uh, traditional songs uh, for young learners and activities. Songs are great with introducing grammar. For example, I used the song London Bridge is Falling Down for uh, presentation and then practicing of present continuous. Songs can help with unmotivated students who may find uh, language learning too tedious uh, and then stimulate the development of personal motivation. Games also facilitate active learning. Such additions as primary books are the great example. Uh, vocabulary games such as uh, bingo have always been extremely popular with uh, pupils. Uh, it could be played with new vocabulary on presentation stage or as a practice or a revision uh, of their previously acquired knowledge. Pupils need to uh, draw several words from the list of targeted vocabulary, pick a card one by one and cross the word, uh, cross the pictures till they get bingo. For practicing reading, a game with flashcards and a ball. Uh, learners are divided into two teams or they can play as a whole class. Learners throw a ball into a basket and uh, read the word on the flashcards. Uh, they get a point only if they read the word correctly. TPR-based games like Simon Says, Miming Games helps pupils to contextualize the target language, uh, as well as mingling activities like Find Someone Who. Uh, the development of cultural awareness is a major factor in language acquisition. Teacher needs to make learners aware with, uh, with the cultural background of the language they are learning. Uh, building up cross-cultural knowledge is extremely relevant in today's global society. Through cross-cultural knowledge, learners uh, can become aware not only of other cultures, but can discover new features in their own. 
with young learners, uh, development of cultural awareness can be done through extracurricular activities. For example, fairy tale showcases. First, learners read a fairy tale, acquiring any necessary language skills in the process. Fairy tales are a great resource of authentic materials for young learners. Um, while preparing for the performance, students are learning through experience and don't have a conscious realization that they are indeed in the process of language acquisition. Young learners are still developing their cognitive skills. So during the classes where a teacher can give cultural background to the language, pupils can start developing basic comparing and analyzing skills. I used to dedicate lessons or even extracurricular sessions to such topics as holidays. And this is a great course book for that with video materials. It provides not only cultural background for topics like school, holidays, food, Christmas, but also can uh, give an opportunity to develop cross-cultural knowledge to young children. Uh, extracurricular activities raise uh, learners' motivation for further stages in learning. Keeping up a positive classroom atmosphere is necessary for a successful learning. With young learners, I found, uh, found out that uh, overreaction and uh, projection will help them to focus on me during the explanation or presentation stages. Implementing classroom routines is one of the uh, most effective classroom management techniques. Classroom routines uh, are the elements of the lesson that are become consistent in your class. They also allow students to develop familiar familiarity with the lesson structures. Uh, routines will help students better understand what is happening throughout the lesson, uh, so they uh, will less likely misbehave and they will be more likely to stay motivated throughout the lesson. Some of the routines for young learners that I used uh, are on the screen. The key concept of language teaching classroom is graded language. For primary school children, we choose simple words and phrases. And as learners uh, can learn chunks of language while hearing them again and again, it is useful to use a fixed set of exponents from early on. So teaching basic classroom language by repeating it over and over again. Our instructions in the classroom need to be sequenced, which means using language in a logical order. Especially with the young learners, instructions need to be short, clear, and logical for pupils to comprehend. For giving out worksheets, there is a very good technique which saves time and allows pupils to focus on instructions. Read, instruct, check, and only then hand out. During the last few months, we all have been put into a peculiar situation and had to adapt our methods and techniques. Young learners especially are in need of support in this challenging time. Digital resources and technologies, websites become the key components in the learning process. And the first way of facilitating the learning is to make video lessons. Although they are time consuming, this method gives a teacher opportunity to focus on vocabulary or grammar topics they see the most important for achieving lesson objectives. For learners, video lessons provide a way to study at their own pace. They can always come back to any point in the lesson or watch it several times. For working with pronunciation and vocabulary, this is extremely important. One of the uh, easiest ways uh, to make a video lesson is to use, for example, my Microsoft Point uh, presentations. Young learners also need connection to the teacher and a routine, so for that we can also use such programs as Zoom for our sessions. Primary school children of a younger age will probably need some assistance at first. Such lessons shouldn't be very long, as young learners will have trouble focusing. A teacher can use Zoom for practicing and then developing basic language skills, especially speaking.
Uh, you can divide pupils into pairs or small groups and ask them to practice small dialects or reading uh, in Zoom rooms. Uh, you can also use a variety of functions for development uh, of a specific language skill. Uh, one of the ways of bringing uh, dif different types of activities to the lesson is the use of websites like uh, Kahoot and Quizzes. Pupils do not need to register, they simply follow the link. They provide a variety of activities, for example, filling in, filling in the gaps or multiple choice tasks. The games can be played during the lesson or be assigned as a homework. These websites also give young learners the opportunity to have fun while learning and the element of a friendly competition provides motivation for further language acquisition. Uh, Google Forms and online test pad also can be extremely useful tools in online learning. The interface of Google Forms uh, is intuitive and learners do not need to register. Uh, activities can be develop, uh, adapted. One of the major advantages is that these uh, forms are ex extremely easy to assess and I uh, used uh, it for uh, sum summative assessments. Uh, in the last few months, I came into realization that while teaching online, it is important uh, not to overwhelm oneself and uh, your learners. If you found some resources and methods that, that work for you uh, and your uh, pupils and help them to achieve lesson, uh, lesson's objectives, stick to them. Uh, it is not necessary to use all the websites and resources that uh, are available in the world. All of the points mentioned above are consolidations of um, materials that can be put into practice by every teacher and raise their pupils' uh, motivation. Thank you for attention. Okay, it was our last presentation and we are close to the finish. Now, the president of our association Albina Kasenova. Can you see my presentation? I share the screen. Uh -huh. Can you see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much, all the presenters, all the people, all the teachers who is attending today devoting literally the half of your Saturday morning <laughs> to uh, end the day to participate and attend, not just like passively listening, but really actively engaged in, in our chat box, responding to our presenters' questions. Uh, this is just so amazing. I'm almost in, in tears, you know, seeing that how our teachers uh, across Kazakhstan are so dedicated and love their uh, profession that they can uh, afford doing this, you know, in, on their own uh, without any, like, um, you know, on their own uh, desire to participate and spend their own uh, time uh, participating in this conference. I'm so, so grateful for you, dear colleagues. Uh, this is, I can't express more than enough my gratitude to, to you for attending, for being with us. This is our first time of conference, not only just virtual conference, this is our first time on the <laughs> conference at all. So um, we, we hope that everything went well, you learned a lot, you got um, different perspectives from different speakers. Uh, I hope it was really uh, useful for you and interesting. Also, we will, we want uh, we would like to mention again that uh, we were going to organize this conference this year uh, offline, face to face, but due to COVID nineteen, uh, this is going uh, online, and we're also gaining new experience also organizing this kind of event. 
So as I, as I mentioned today earlier, we, we have our Best Teacher Awards uh, contest, which, were, uh, which started um, in, in, the, in, this, uh, in the beginning of September, which lasted about one month. It, has, it had three stages of the contest where it was test, then it was essay writing, and then it was video presentation with different topics. Uh, and we had 76 teachers of North Kazakhstan participate in this first ever contest uh, by a tank. And I would like to, uh, to announce the results of the contest. Uh, so the first category, um, gosh, I can't see. Tatiana, can you see what's the category? The Zoom is covering. <laughs> I can't hear your microphone. Uh, uh, the results special appreciation category. Ah, uh, yes, special appreciation category. Yeah. So uh, we decided to uh, to nominate some videos and some different in different categories. Uh, some of the teachers which didn't get the place, but still were more than great, and we wanted to really appreciate them. So uh, in the first uh, stage of test. Tshnar uh, Tokishova, congratulations. I'm not sure if she's here. Uh, I, I remember, I think she's from uh, Belim uh, Innovation Lyceum of Petropavlovsk. Congratulations. She had the most, uh, I think uh, she had something 30 out of 30 uh, of the, on the test. I think her, her score was the highest on the first stage. So Tshnar, very happy for you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Evgenia Samoilova. I think she is uh, from rural area. Uh, she she got also an impressive essay on her uh, beliefs, pedagogical beliefs, her uh, philosophy. I think it was very impressive. So we decided to nominate Evgenia. Thank you so much, Evgenia. Antonina Shastoletova. Uh, also, uh, we were really impressed that actually Antonina in her video she actually really mentioned. TESOL's six principles. I was really impressed that um, uh, she knows about that uh, those six principles of TESOL and she tries to implement it. It was really impressive. Thank you so much, Antonina. So I think, oh, sorry. Also, we have Elena Krasnikova, also from rural area. Thank you so much. Your video presentation was also um, interesting and so creative. We were like, with your members, we were so wow. These videos are so creative. We gotta, we, we will post these videos on our YouTube channel too, and on our website. So uh, maybe next week, I believe we will do that. So if you want to watch these videos, they will be available. Just keep in touch and follow our social media. So, <clears throat> Tatiana, can you please read again? I can't see it. Secondary Rural English Teachers Category. Yeah, wow, this is the moment right now. So actually we have, so we had so many, uh, lots of teachers uh, from rural area. It was, I think the biggest uh, amount of teachers we got in this uh, category. It was a really big challenge to decide to make these decisions, yeah. So third place diploma goes to uh, Gulnara Kajigaliyeva. Congratulations, Gulnara. Uh, I'm not sure if she's here, if she can hear it. Uh, yeah, congratulations, great job. Third place uh, uh, diploma goes to Lyubov Polikova from Magjan Zhumabayev district. <laughs> Our uh, uh, active attempt member, by the way, uh, I would like to mention that all uh, all our evaluation they were blind um, um, how do you call it like blind evaluation. So when we did the tests and then when we checked the essays, uh, jury members didn't see the names there. It was covered by the specific um, um, numbers. So we we didn't know anyone who was there. Uh, we didn't know it was really, really like uh, we we tried to make it as much as transparent. Second place goes to Tamara Chireshka. Uh, congratulations from uh, Mablutka uh, district. And the first place go to 
Oh, so, sorry, second place. We have two second place. Sorry. Larisa Popova from the Vita Musrepa uh, district. Congratulations. Well done. And the first place goes to Valentina Trushnikova, Yesil district. Congratulations. Well done. Great job. So, as we said, uh, uh, as we said, uh, second, and, uh, all the uh, all the winners will get web cameras, uh, and they will get first place winners will get Duolingo English test grant for free, and then uh, we will get um, Oxford University Press books and bags and all their like package of um, of gifts. So congratulations, dear colleagues. Mm -hmm. So next category. Uh, another, another category we had. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Okay, let's just do it. So, third place diploma goes to Aidana Mindikeva. Um, is it Lord's School Gymnasium? Uh, yeah. Congratulations, Aidana. Great job. Third place diploma goes to Kamara Hamzina. I think she's also from. Uh, uh, rural area, but she works at the, in the gymnasium. Second place diploma, Diana Zarikova. Very interesting video. Thank you so much, Diana. I hope she's here. <laughs> and the first place diploma goes to uh, Grunara Yakovchenka, uh, Akain district. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so the next category. Uh, yeah, I can see this, I think. Or uh, secondary, secondary Petropavlovsk teachers. So this category is mainstream school teachers from Petropavlovsk. Uh, so uh, first I would like to mention that unfortunately we didn't get much videos and uh, not only videos but entries from uh, Petropaul secondary uh, school teachers. Uh, I hope we're going to improve it next time. But from those what we received, um, we decided to make this uh, to, to, to award Camila Alimjanova. Uh, I think she's from school number 20 Petropaulsk third place diploma. Congratulations, Camila. Thank you so much. Very interesting and creative video. Uh, and your essay is also very interesting. Thank you. I think we got only one person for Petropolis teachers. And uh, the next category is uh, secondary vocational and tertiary education. So it's college and uh, universities. Mm -hmm. Alexey Alexeyev, uh, second place goes to you. Thank you so much for your interesting entry in our contest and the first place goes to uh, Tatevik Aslanyan. Tatevik really interesting and creative video and your essays uh, so deep and so reflective shows your uh, really understanding and your pedagogical beliefs. beliefs. Thank you so much. It was really just so marvelous to read all your entries. Okay, so thank you so much. So these are our con contestants winners. We will uh, contact you uh, shortly. So thank you so much. We are so happy and glad to uh, announce these winners. And uh, those who didn't take part in this year, we hopefully we're going to see you next year in our next contact. Here I would like to um, show our future events for the next year. Uh, so as we mentioned, <coughs> a tank a tank received excuse me a new grant from the US embassy to Kazakhstan <coughs> for our new events <coughs> so take a look at these events we 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 will be posting uh, all these uh, events and projects on our social media uh, on our website please stay in touch uh yeah and be involved with us as you can see we're planning to this is just a great news uh we are planning to conduct 
podcast conference and, uh, and uh, attend conference 2020 in Petropavlovsk. So this is just a great news for us as a, a regional association that CASTI, Kazakhstani Teachers of English Association, they trusted us to uh, deliver and to conduct this um, a conference in Petropavlovsk in 2022. So those teachers who are now watching us from other regions of Kazakhstan, <laughs> keep in touch. Uh, hopefully you're gonna apply to, to participate in our conference and um, we will welcome you here in Petropavlovsk. Uh, so these are our events for the next year. And uh, uh, again, I would like to repeat um, this, uh, our social, social media, atank.kz, please visit our website. Uh, please follow us on our Instagram. We also have newsletter Google group. And if you email us, we will add you to our Google group. And through that um, Google group, we share different professional development opportunities, different project information, leaflets. So if you're really interested in your PD, please, contact us via email and we will add you to that group. Also, uh, as I've seen different messages coming asking about PowerPoints of the presenters, they will be available on our website. I, I will just quickly uh, show you how to get um, how to get there. Tatiana, can you see this website? Is it showing now? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, colleagues, when you, uh, to download the presentation, you will need to go to our website. Uh, you, you need to use English version because there is Russian and Kazakh versions, but we highly recommend you to use only Russian uh, English version because it's the most latest update we update it um, more often. So, go to projects. So, when you highlight the projects, there you will see conferences. And then you will see here attend conference 2020. So, when you click here uh, here we will post uh presentations on on this page okay so again projects conferences attend conference 2020 okay so this is the way how you can get to the um uh do the uh, powerpoints so uh dina can you please share the link for our uh for our teachers in the chat box did you post it already Yes, I have already posted it. Uh -huh. Can you repeat it again? So, dear teachers, the certificates will be sent to you uh, if you complete this Google form. Okay, so be careful how you write your names and your email because it will be, so your names will be basically shown on the certificates and your email. We will use your email to, to send those certificates to you. So, please be careful because sometimes we get uh, wrong emails and it blocks us. Uh, okay, thank you so much once more again. I think I'm already over talking right now. I would like to uh, thank Dina and uh, Tatiana today for um, assisting and helping and delivering and organizing <laughs> this conference. And thank you so much, dear colleagues, for being with us today and having time, your time with us. Thanks. Thank you so much, all our um, all our sponsors, uh, as Oxford University Press, Interpress. Uh, a huge thank to the U.S. Embassy in Kazakhstan, uh, the National Alumni Network, and as, oh, of course to our Education Department for promoting our events and supporting us. It was our farewell speech. <laughs> yeah.